Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the eve of Cheltenham for Road to Cheltenham. Ruby Walsh and I are down here on the track, ready for, to talk through the four days of Cheltenham. We've been talking, Ruby, since the middle of November about all of the races, and this is the major stop on our journey. How are you feeling? Oh, it looks great to be here, Lydia. The place looks great. Um, track's in good nick. A lot more grass than there was this time mm. last year. Look, it's been very wet, but no real frost. Definitely has helped the grass grow. John Poolin has given it as soft, I think. Um, I think that's what he's given it. And it's, it is damp, it is wet. It's going to take a bit of getting, but look, it's grey today, but it'll be hopefully a bit nicer tomorrow. They've had a little bit of rain on Saturday night going into Sunday and yesterday again on Sunday. I think it's mostly dry today, a chance of some drizzle, also some chance of some showers on the first day. It's definitely soft and there's some, so it's still holding on to heavy in the cross country course as well. Yeah, I haven't been in there and uh, come to think of it, I probably won't, won't be in there either. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it is obviously very wet in the cross country course. I think looking at that this morning, You'd be kind of siding the Cocoa Beach in the cross-country race, but uh, I think we have a lot more to talk about than just the cross-country race. We have. We are going to talk about all the major races and everything else besides over the course of this two hours. And if you watch this programme regularly, you will know that we are added to this team by Nick Luck, who will be out on the track talking to participants and bringing you up to date with the latest news. Let's get on with it. Lydia, one of my favourite days of the year because you get so close to the horses which you, you really can't do on, on any other occasion. Zoe Smalley does all the travelling for Henry de Bromhead Stable. She's been here for Gold Cups, for Champion Hurdles. She's walked back with Grand National winners. She might be walking back with a Kim Muir winner here, am I right? He's quite a, quite a handful this morning. Uh, yeah, he's feeling well. I suppose the string have gone ahead of him. Uh, they're being ridden up and he's just feeling well. He, li he likes it here. Um, yeah, just enjoying being away. Do you, find, well. do you find that most of your boys and girls really grow a hand when they come here yeah. do you find the place just gives them that pep yeah definitely and a lot of them know where they are uh manella indo is here for his fifth festival <laughs> uh, and he knows exactly where he is this will be his seventh time running in cheltenham uh so he knows but yeah they just there's so much atmosphere and excitement around the place and they just get it look at him he just gets it I did say to Henry yesterday when we were talking to him that his horses do seem to lift a little bit through the season with this very much as the target. Do you see that in the way that he trains them at home? Um, I do. I always, touch wood, I always just think, I don't know how he does it year on year, but he seems to have them exactly right for the, for the festival. And, and you're, you're here, Zoe, with the first tranche of horses, the next lot coming over later in the week. How much of this is fun for you and how much of it is really hard work and, and a lot of logistical complexity? Uh, look, it's all hard work and there's a lot of logistical complexity, but it's all fun. It's what we work for all year, um, to bring the horses and let them be on the big stage, hopefully be the best versions of themselves. Uh, Zoe, thanks so much for talking to me. I hope Am I Right is going to be the best <laughs> version of himself. So do I. We we can only aspire to be the best versions of ourselves, Lydia, but give, give it my best shot this morning. Yes, fingers crossed for the next two hours and also for the rest of the week, as far as we're concerned. Now, if you watch this show regularly, you know how it works. We're going to go through Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and then come back to Wednesday, because at the end of the show, we will have the declarations and we'll find out about things about headgear. And I was going to be firing my <laughs> questions at you about your thoughts about headgear and changes to aids or new aids during the course of the show. It, that, it's the, the final facet of the jigsaw being put into place. Yeah, it is. And look, obviously, uh, Willie declared a few at Hoods yesterday and different people changed headgear and horses as well. Yeah, it's the final piece of the jigsaw really, but it'll be interesting to see how it all goes. It will be, and we'll talk about that during the course of the show. Uh, we want you to get involved as ever. We're always important to have the roadies as part of the Road to Cheltenham show. We're going to show you this times, this year's social poll in a moment. But first, Ruby, we're going to reflect on last year's social poll from this time last year. This is the question that we asked you. Here it is. Which of these four hot favourites do you think is the most vulnerable and why? Can you remember how the road is voted here? I can. I was deeply offended. <laughs> well, they were wrong. Let's have a look at the answer. Oh, ye of little fit. Yeah, 35.4% Gallop and Dichon. They're right about Jerry Colomb, they're right about Shishkin. Yep. And 11% were quite hopeful about their way of Constitution Hill. This time around, something similar. So let's have a look at this year's poll, shall we? And it focuses 
on Paul Townend. Which of these four hot pot rides is the most vulnerable at Cheltenham? Is it Stateman in the Champion Hurdle, Lossiemouth in the Mare's Hurdle, Ballyburn in the Gallagher Bearing Bingham, or El Fabiolo? in the Queen Mother Champion Chase. Give us your views and most importantly, as ever, we want to know why. Show your working. Your working is the thing that we cherish here the most, isn't it? There has to be a reason anyway. Absolutely, right. Okay, so let's start with the Tuesday. We'll go through it chronologically. So starting with the Sky Bet Supreme, let's take a look at the betting. The first thing, of course, was at the weekend, we learned that Bally Byrne was not going to go here. Stable companion Tully Hill now tops the market for Paul Townend. The other stable companion, Mystical Power, is there for Mark Walsh. Firefox and Slade Steel following up. So Henry de Bromhead has kept to his word. He said, wherever Bally Byrne goes with the first two novice hurdlers, we will go to the other race, and that other race is the Supreme. So Tully Hill has been a work in progress, particularly in terms of the way he jumps, Ruby. Oh, yeah, definitely. And he's improved uh, with each run, Lydia. And his last run was OK without being brilliant. That punches down. And it's more the fact that he backs off. Here he is as a third hurdle and just takes an extra stride when he doesn't need to. Um, he did it a couple of times in this race at Punchestown, and you're thinking, ah, come on, horse. That was his very first run. He got a lot better than that. This is his second start at Nace. Paul bounced him out, and he was better, still not brilliant. He's a bit, little bit deliberate. Um, away from the stands in Nace, then Paul was riding him at that hurdle, but he doesn't ever fly through the air. You think that was spectacular, but it was a lot better than his first start. And then his third start is going to come up at Punchestown in the novice hurdle. Now, he goes from the back of the last to the line very strong at Nace and absolutely hosed up and does the same at Punchestown. You can see him here. He, that's a lot better than he was in his very first start. But again, tomorrow, he's going to have to be better again. Now, he goes a bit to his left. So maybe here at Cheltenham, that will suit, jumping yep. a little bit left into the inside. There's no doubt about the ability or the engine. It's just, can he not slow down too much to jump? And presume, has he been schooled again? Since? I'd say he has... Having nightmares about hurdles. Um, yeah, he's done a lot of school. Intensive work, essentially, to try and yeah, close that. Yeah, the squeezes have been put on him, yeah. yeah. And Paul was happy with him the last two mornings schooling, so hopefully he replicates that on the track. Both at Nace and at Punchestown last time, he was unchallenged on the lead. That is not going to happen. There's a lot of pace on in the Supreme, isn't there? Uh, yeah, there tends to be, but that's more t tension, hype, expectation. Actually, when you look at it, what is going to go a really strong gallop? I don't think there's a massive amount to really drag him. Uh, they'll go quick to the first and probably as far as we are here, but I could see the race slowing down from there and it'll be on soft ground as well, so I think they could slow down considerably. Is he going to have to get the first right to execute the plan A in Paul Tanner's well, head? It's always good to start in the front foot anyway, um, <laughs> but it's a short run to the first hurdle, so they won't be going that hard by the time they get there, and that'll be a help to him. And then, I, I, no, I won't have to get on the front end to execute a plan. He just wants to get him into a rhythm. And I, I just think on soft ground, they won't be going. They won't be flying. OK. Let's have a look at Mystical Power, shall we? Uh, we chatted a bit prior after the Moscow Flyer about how he was a little bit on edge beforehand, so I can understand the first time hood with him. Yeah, um, he did look to be quite relaxed. I saw him earlier this morning, he looked to be quite relaxed. But he did get keen at Punchestown. They didn't go hard. Lambron was making the run, and he jumps OK, Mystical Power, but it just at times does switch on and gets keen. Now, he did show a really good turn of foot here at Punchestown, and he quickened up nicely. Jagoro, Lambron, built by Valleymore, who runs in a handicap. He jumped poorly, but he was here that was really impressive about mystical power he's a horse that shows more on the track than he does at home but the occasion it's how he copes with it he's as you said wearing a hood and he'll have to settle and again you're thinking oh supreme they'll go hard that'll help him i can't see them going flat out in the supreme can you no i don't see them going i think they'll go quick early but i think it's a race that'll slow down a lot okay um Certainly, if you do have a doubt about the preliminaries, probably the Supreme is the worst race to be running in, don't you think? Yes, it is. I, and even more so, and to be a bigger crowd on Friday, but the anticipation yeah. before the first race tomorrow, yeah, it is a different atmosphere here tomorrow. Yeah, the famous roar. Now, Mr Gift, the staple companion, is also wearing a first-time hood. Can you see that? Yeah, um, I didn't think he was that keen in Limerick no. myself, but um, he is wearing a first-time hood. He was really impressive in that race in Limerick, but it was a much, much lesser race. He's a good bit to improve, but yeah, he is wearing a hood. I think he was keen in France more so than he ever was for us. Okay, and um, 
on the preview circuit, and understandably because he was a definite runner in this race, Firefox was very popular, two good reasons, dropping back in trip from the Lawless and Nace over two and a half miles, and also Gordon Elliott's horses weren't on it at that period of time, were they? I think it's more that than the trip, because I don't think he'd have won at the third last hurdle in Nace, which was in or around two miles. He wasn't going to win that race at that point either, so I think it was definitely that the horses were under a bit of a cloud. He obviously beat Ballyburn in the maiden hurdle. He was a very good bumper horse. He beat Hill Atlantique as well, so he has really strong bumper form and can't be discounted, but I think it was the yard form more so than the trip at Nace for him. You mentioned Ballyburn, and I mentioned when we had a look at the betting that Slade still now runs here. Is that arguably a seven length of repeat? I think it was seven lengths by, by Ballyburn. Is that the best? The DRF, the, it looked it on the time. The best form in the race? I, I think it did. I mean, you look at where a King of Kingsfield in third in that occasion. Um, he's a mark of 140. I, I think it is probably the best bit of bump, uh, novice hurdle form, part, that's my, in my opinion, anyway. Um, Slade Steel, I, I thought when he won his maiden hurdle at Nace. He, he dug in and ground it out and went to win. I thought he'd be a better horse over further. I do think two and a half probably suits him better. Um, but I think he'll have to go to win this. That said, he, he, went, he went well in a deep race. He held his position quite readily. He just wasn't, uh, didn't have the turn of foot of Ballyburn. He wasn't quite as slick over his hurdles when it mattered in the latter stages. And that run should stand to him here. Yeah. Um, it definitely should stand to him. I think he's a good jumper, but he just does look like a bit of a stare to me. Maybe, that's, maybe that'll be enough. Well, given the, the way in which you're talking about the race being set up, maybe not? No, but look, t time will tell. And it, a lot that will depend too on when they go, when they up the, up the ante, who gets involved. If they do go slow and they get competitive at the top of the hill, if they start quick, then from there, you really have to stay. So a lot will depend on one thing slowing it down, but if someone slows it down too much, other people get anxious then and you end up going too fast too soon. Yeah, and the race develops a little bit too far out. In the wrong place. Comes into yeah. Play. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We saw that in the Cleve, didn't we, um, when we last saw the, the Cleve? Uh, right, we've been focusing on jumping, haven't we? Let's have a look at some race IQ data on it. And this is focusing on the average speed lost of some of the key contenders here. And it shows that Tully Hill has got a little bit better from race to race down the bottom, but it is still markedly an issue compared with Jericho de Ropene, who has also showed that steady progress and mystical power. Yeah, these are all miles per hour. So if you look at Jericho de Repine, he's gotten better from his first start at Newbury to his last run at Doncaster. He's only losing a little over two miles per hour as he jumps. Mystical power has been pretty solid from Galway and Punchestown. But you can see where Tully Hill is. He's losing over five miles an hour on average at his jumps. That's how much he's slowing down. When you slow down that, you have to quicken it up again. Yeah. Um, so he has to take a bit off that speed. He can't slow down as much as he has been. The imponderable in this race is Jericho de Repine, and that is, of course, because of the form of the Nicky Henderson yard. Constitution taken out, Hill taken out with a chest infection. Last 15 runners, two winners, two placed horses, three unplaced, and nine pulled up. Now, if you have a look at Timeform's analysis of the Henderson yard performance at this time of year, there tends to be a little bit of a lull, and it tends to recover in March. But this is the lowest lull in five years that the yard has had. Yeah, and it's a tricky time for them. Um, of course, you'd love your horses to be absolutely bombing and the winners going in. And I'd imagine however confident they are, or hopeful they are, they'll be nervous watching the first tomorrow. Well, they had a mare running at Sandown on Saturday and she was with withdrawn on veterinary advice by the vets. They've got one runner at Plumpton today, so all eyes are going to be on Fierce Warrior and how he performs at the two o'clock. The flip side to that coin with Jericho de Ropine, who's always looked like a horse of class, albeit that his form doesn't really stack up in the same kind of way. You can't put a big figure on it in any kind of way. I did like the fact that he managed to win dirty last time at Doncaster, showing he'd got some heart. But the flip side is he is drifting and he's going to probably continue to drift as people talk about people like us talk about the form so when does he get to a backable price Absolutely. that's the next question isn't it i don't know what a backable price is for him to tell you the truth whereas i think i i think you'd have to watch him do you? Oh, yeah, I do. I think he'll get to a price myself Fair that I'd be prepared yeah. to risk it. You can risk yours, but I'm definitely not. I want to watch him. He's already a, a bigger price than he was after winning just one hurdle, and he's already become more substantial. I can since. see, I can see all that, but I will definitely watch him. And Nicky Henderson has piles more runners for the rest of the week. Okay, yeah, you know where you stand after day one, I think, with the Nicky Henderson yard form. Right. So you just saw that race IQ data. It's something that we've been featuring prominently on Road to Shelton throughout the series. Paige Fuller, who is their analyst, and you will remember her as a top rider as well. She is now with Nick Luck. Lydia Shears, we're down by the last fence on the old course, the fence that El Fabiello and John Bum will jump. 
in the Queen Mother Champion Chase on Wednesday. We're going to talk about how Race IQ might be able to best analyse their relative chances in just a moment. But first of all, Paige, why are we here with Race IQ? What was the, the thought behind it in the first place? Well, I've been really grateful to Ruby and Lydia for helping us on this journey for the last four months. It's been it's been quite a journey, but obviously they've done a great job at explaining to all of you guys who've been watching um, what we're doing. But the main reason why we, we started this journey was to try and open up a little bit more to the fans and the punters and everybody else who watches racing, because you know, most sports have a lot of data provided, and so RMG realised that actually it was the side of racing that we really need to explore mm -hmm. a little bit more. And racing is a sport that relies heavily on what you might call homespun wisdom or received wisdom and relies rather less, particularly in this country, on data. You're trying to change that. For example, El Fabiola, you've been on the preview circuit. All you've heard is, ah, oh, he can nudge one, he can bulldoze one, he can make a mistake, he's not a great jumper. John Bon is considered to be, generally speaking, bar last time, a very good jumper and might have the advantage in that respect. What does Race IQ tell us about their relative merits from last year? Yeah, so what's amazing is we've got these trackers on the horses which capture 18 data points a second. So we can literally see every movement from them for over an obstacle. And last year, you know, we don't have very much, as you say, comparative um, data for them this season. But if you look back on the champion chase last year, even though, you know, we, we could question El Fabiolo, he still gained three lengths on John Bon. And since neither of them seem to have improved again this mm. season, just from their own relative performances, actually, I can't really see that changing I don't know about you but you know it's hard to it's hard to argue that it's going to be different so what your eye is telling you about technique and what might look aesthetically pleasing to the eye in terms of shape and so forth is not necessarily translated in length gained and lost and momentum exactly that so again we can break lengths gain jumping into speed lost speed recovery time time it takes for them to travel through our jumping envelope which is 30 meters either side of the fence and from all of those factors we can work out how much of an advantage or a disadvantage it is for those horses so again just trying to capture the younger generation's minds a bit more like you'll hear ruby and, and lydia talking a little bit about the supreme novices and how much speed they're losing and if a horse is losing like five miles an hour of speed that's five miles an hour they've got back to get back up compared to your comparative horse that's only losing two miles an hour. That takes its toll. Did your opinions gained through riding horses inform part of this or part of your thinking, or have you been surprised by what you've learned from the data relative to what you thought when you were riding? So I think, and I know Ruby's sort of in our conversations we've had has felt the same, like there's so many things that we were trying to explain that we couldn't, you know, horse hanging in the air that might, again, like John Bon, jumps really well, stay away Faye, again, another one who jumps really well, but just hangs in the air. And it's amazing how we can reflect on that. But actually now we've got the data to back it up. I'm hoping for you guys as presenters, pundits, it can just give you that data. We're not trying to revolutionize your opinions, just try and help give you numbers to back up what you've already seen. I was always told that your IQ is your IQ and you can't improve it. Paige Fuller, now Lydia, and the team at Race IQ are showing us rather different. And it is an evolving thing, isn't it? We've said yeah. that from the start of this series. Race IQ, all of us, Paige, everybody, is learning from what we see and it's something that's going to be refined over time and we're going to get better with it. You, I think. you started at a blank canvas, you know, trying to figure out how you do put figures on what you felt, what you're seeing, and yeah, it is something that is evolving. And the one that really interests me is the horses slowing down, the mm. speed loss, the horses hanging in the air. Uh, I think that's the biggest one that I, I find anyway. During the course of this series, actually, we've come to focus more on that, haven't we? Yeah, we have, because um, it's to me that's against the, each individual horse, mm. not so much against comparing it to the one beside it. It's actually, what that horse is doing, it's giving you a picture of that individual horse. And if I take us back right to the very first show of the series, that's where we were anticipating we might get to. And over time, with a career or over a season, you can build up a picture it, of that, Exactly, yeah, that's what you're hoping for. And then, look, John Bonney's is interested in tomorrow's arc, or tomorrow's champion chase, even, or Tuesdays, Wednesdays. Um, but, yeah, he he does have to improve. I think the scope is there for him to take a, a bit of time off his jumping. Yeah, yeah, um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later on in the show. We need to get on with the second race on day one, the Tuesday, and that is the My Pension Expert Arkle. Let's have a look at the betting for it. Surprise! Gaelic Warrior turns up here rather than in the Turners. Hunter's Yarn, who's been uh, a real feature of the preview circuit and certainly the uh, number crunchers like him. He's 11 to 2 joint second favourite with his other stable companion, Il et Tom. So the betting says, certainly Paddy Power's betting says, that Willie Mullins dominates this race. Next best in is founder 50 at 6 to 1. So let's focus on Gaelic Warrior and we'll start with last time. 
he, we, we, you and I didn't like him beforehand. He was, he was agitated even before he went keenly and didn't look himself at it, the Dublin Mason. He did. Festival. This is the fourth fence and he heads off to his right, which we know he's prone to do. But at the fifth fence then past the stands, to my eye, he goes fairly straight at that one. Um, and then he goes on to the sixth fence, which is next. Um, again, he can jump right, he can ju let fly, he can get in close. Stumbles at the back of the fourth last here and it was like he just turned him off. He was beaten by the time he got to the third last and he unseated Paul at the, at the last fence. To me, he didn't run his race, but he has still run that race. So that is the last piece of form you have of him. He's wearing a hood to try and keep the lid on him, I suppose, in um, the preliminaries. What do you think of that? I'd say it's not a bad thing. What uh, happened last year? What, they tried earplugs last year. He had earplugs they? last year. What well, he won't come out in the way to the start. Right. And Patrick got it back in. But he wore earplugs last year, and he definitely behaved better at Chatham than he did at the Dublin Racing Festival. So he's got a hood on him. But I, I think he has to overcome that run and prove he's a grade one horse at two miles. That's a bigger question mark. It is a big question mark. Let's have a look at what happened in the Ballybor as it was then bearing Bingham. Patrick Mullins was on board. He's down the inside. This is three out and this is typical him. Out to his right. Yeah, out to his right, but not massively. And you wouldn't, if that's as right as he goes, uh, Tomorrow afternoon, he'd be happy, but he does go plenty right here at the last hurdle, and he was well off the bridle. He was well beaten by Ian Perry Pass. That's Cham Kylie in front of him, Hamrez Allen behind him. Look, I think at this level, he has to prove that he's the real deal. He got outspeeded quite readily by Ian Perry Pass on the home turn in that race. He did. Um, How would you ride this horse? Behind the pace. I'd ride the race more so than the horse. I think there's plenty of pace in here. Matata, Calixius found a 50. Enough for horses to go forward. I wouldn't be like I wouldn't be revving Gaelic Warrior up to go because horses that I think that's the best way to get a slow horse beaten. You have to then find his feet and whether that's that he's sitting second, he's sitting in front or he's sitting fifth, I would be wherever he's comfortable. And I'm assuming you'd be down the inside. Absolutely. Yeah, trying to limit the amount of time, have bodies on his I'd outside. I'd be letting the other lads keep me straight. Yeah, OK. And at some point, if he does hit the front, I mean, if he's going right, there are a few of these that, that are likely to mimic him, aren't there? Well, the horses generally do, don't they? Mm -hmm. uh, like sheep, uh, the one goes that all follow. But um, I'd say by the time he gets to the front, I could imagine it might be late enough in the rest. If you had a free hand, is this the race you'd run him in? I think there's question marks with him and Fasa Viga. Both of them have a lot to prove, and I think both the Turners and the Arkell are very, very open races. Uh, one is in one race, the other is in the other race. Hopefully one of them is in the right race, but I'm not so sure. They've bought a lot of their copy books. The tight turning track here has got to be an issue, hasn't it, as compared to the more galloping turners. That's where I could give Gaelic Warriors some airtime. Yeah, I think he's a lot to prove. OK. Yeah, I tend to agree. Let's join Nick. Patrick, alongside me, with you ought to know, one of the many Mullins runners in the bumper on Wednesday. And this is normally the time we find out what you're going to ride, but it's not this fella, is it? No, um, I'm going to ride Jasmine Laveau. Uh, far from sure, the right call, but look, he, he put in the, the performance at Nice, and uh, he's worked with me good since, so I'm going to take my chances with him. And you're obviously so heavily involved in these, these bumper horses. You know better than anyone, they can work brilliantly run completely differently. It must be quite a complex judgment call for you, this. You almost know them too well. Uh, yeah, they're all improving at different rates. And, you know, you often see where like, our number one jockey gets it wrong most is the novice hurdles early in the season. And our bumper horses only run once or maybe twice before they run. So it's hard to know, but um, I get it right every so often, but uh, not as much as I'd like to. Um, if you could ride one of the others, which one would it have been? In the bumper? Yeah. Oh, well, I, look, I think I think Gordon's horse that won Leopards on Christmas, uh, Jalon, Jalon Duderiz, uh, he was the one that caught my eye. Um, as far as your first jockey is concerned, Paul Townend, analysing what he's riding over the next couple of days, do you think he's got it right uh, most of the time? Yeah, I, I don't think he's had too many tricky decisions. Um, I think the, the one that'll be the trickiest for him maybe is the Triumph Hurdle. Um, but I think the rest of them have kind of picked themselves. OK, what would you ride in the Triumph Hurdle? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, that's it. It's, it there's, a, there's not much between any of them. And, like, Salvador Mundi, Salvador Mundi could be anything, but obviously it's not, um, not an ideal prep. So he's, uh, he's uh, the kind of unknown. I mean, obviously everyone's seen Salvador Mundi with second to Sergino in that, in that race in France. Does he, does he look at home like a horse of, of that sort of calibre? His work is very good. Is it? His work is very good. And, um, you know, we brought him galloping in Leopardstown there. We brought him to the races. Willie had him up walking around the parade ring just to get him, you know, so when he arrived over here, it wasn't even his first time 
hearing the microphones and everything, the race, the atmosphere since, you know, a long time. So he seemed to handle all that well. But, you know, coming here on your first run of the season is very difficult. But Penn Hill did it mm. um, before, so it's not impossible. And we know about all the obvious horses over the next couple of days, El Fabiolo, um, Ballyburn on Wednesday, uh, Factor File, same day, State Man in the Champion Hurdle. There's not much you can tell us about them that we don't already know. You might be able to tell me how sure you are that the stable's going to win the Supreme, and if so, with which horse? Um, well, yeah, look, I think we've got a super team. I mean... Just for six. Totally, totally. Hill is uh, his jumping. I screwed him there last week. His jumping has got much quicker. He's still not particularly brave or long at them, but he's much better getting in tight and being quick. Okay. So that's fine. Um, Mystical Power is he keeps surprising us. I mean, we started when we started him off in Banner Rove last May. Did we think we'd be favoured for the Supreme? Not at all. So he's the one who keeps improving every run. We don't know where his ceiling is. Um, but the one that I think could be the dark horse is Mr. Giff. I jumped him last week, he jumps like a gazelle, uh, he's got an awful lot of speed and he's unexposed. I mean, it's coincidence that he won the same maiden hurdle as um, State Man, but uh, he just could be very good. I think that was the little gem that we were, we were waiting for. Patrick, yeah. thank you so much. Enjoy the rest okay. of the week. Thanks very much, Nick. Patrick Mullins, Lydia, there you go, Mr Giff in the Supreme. Thank you very much, Patrick. We'll be keeping an eye out for that one, won't we? Um, great to hear from him. We're going to crack on with the our Arkle preview, and we're going to go to the Irish Arkle form, where Ilete Tom not only downed his stable companion Vassal Vega, but ran out found a 50 in the closing stages. Yeah, I found a 50. It obviously won the Grade 1 at Leperstown at Christmas as well. And I, again, they were two tactical races in Leperstown. They didn't go overly hard in either, and... I wonder would found a 50 be better off in this race, getting a lead and getting dragged along. He did so. run in the Drinmore over two and a half, but look, Jack Kennedy controlled the Arkle uh, from the front. He let that dump jump well, bar that the fourth fence was the only sort of a mistake he made. But I think this turned into a real dash, and the found a 50 goes with Fasal Viga from the second last. Danny lets Paul and Jack go, and then comes at Jack from the last fence and mugs him. So, you know, it was tactical. I wouldn't have very much between these two horses. But I think they've both achieved more at two miles than the favourite has, and a hell of a lot more than Hunter's Yarn has. So when you're looking at prices, I think these two are more appealing at the odds than the other two. I tend to agree with that. Let's linger on the founder 50 point first of all. The finishing speed for that race was 111.38%, which underlines the fact that it was a steadily run turned into a sprint. It had been the same previously when founder 50 uh, uh, won. I don't think he likes leading. He does adjust right. I wonder whether even with a lead, he might jump a bit straighter. It could, is that Yeah, fair? he could. Look, last year he was a runaway, so he led. But he's not a runaway this year. Even in down well on his first start over fences, he didn't tear away. I think he will be better getting the lead. Uh, I thought he jumped really well in the Drinmore when Let's Be Clear about it took it off him. He ultimately got outstayed by uh, Maximus, but I don't think there's any shame in that no. over two and a half and heavy ground. And I think he's definitely gone to value at this stage. So we're looking at Matata and Quilixios to go forward. Presumably. Yeah, and, and Jack is not going to line up at the back. He'll line up to go with them too. And all you need is one or two horses to push Matata and he'll go hard enough. Going back to Il Et Etant, on Thursday's live show, we chatted to Danny Mullins and we've gone through how we think, I mean, there is a doubt about Cheltenham, but you can excuse individually both the run in the Triumph and the run in the Supreme, can't you? Oh, definitely. He was way too keen in the Triumph and then things didn't go right for him. Missed the fourth last hurdle in the, in the Supreme, got outside Marine National and then raced off the top of the hill. So, look, things can go wrong in any horse race. They've gone wrong twice for Il Et Etant here. Maybe it'll be third time lucky. Yeah, it could be. Uh, lots of people um, looking back to Cheltenham's of the past will be saying Ileti Tom's quite a small horse, how will he deal with Cheltenham? Those fences aren't as scary as they used to be, are they? No, uh, things have evolved they're not as stiff as they once were, but is that a bad thing? It's probably not either. No, no, I'm just saying in terms no, yeah, of no, yeah. it's not something I think I'd hold against no. Ileti Tom. No. Yeah. OK, let's have a look at perhaps the chief British hope, and this is JPR1. For me, he's got to improve quite a bit to get involved. He probably does, but to be fair to JPR1, uh, he jumped really well here in November uh, until he got to the last fence, and I think it was just speed that caught him out there at that mighty time on his outside. And look, this, the form is not going to be good enough, but he was going to be impressive this day, knuckled on landing and got rid of Brendan Powell. And then he went to Sandown and did not the same, but something similar. The Patron had dragged him from a long way out, gets the second last all wrong, dribbles out in his nose again, and that ultimately cost him, and he folded. But I did, do think he was impressive enough at Linkfield on his last start, and you know, with a couple of better jumps, he could be coming here in the back of winning four races, and he might be in your mind. Did you think he folded quite cheaply after what was essentially just a bad peck at Sandown? Possibly, but I, 
the patron had dragged them. They had gone a good gallop and regained the momentum. You know, some horses can do it, others can't. And I wouldn't. To get against the hill and sand down too, you're starting to climb and you peck, and it's just a bad fence to miss. Okay, let's have another look at the betting. I just want to talk about Hunter Jean because, as I said, number crunchers love him. He's been all talk on the preview circuit. The vibe I got from you and the vibe I get from the Willie Mullins team is he is not championship division. I don't think he is. I think he's a bit to prove. I don't think he was as good a hurdler as the other two. Um, I don't think he's as good a chaser, but I won't mind being wrong. But no, he doesn't. He'd be the outsider of the tree for me anyway. Jumping issues as well, potentially? Fell first time, jumped a bit better the second time. but well, um, too out. He did, yeah. Yeah, I just, I don't, maybe he is, I just, he's not for me anyhow. Yeah. Could the pace drag my mate Mozzie in? No. Mistakes from Master Chewy have got to be an issue, haven't they? They have, but to go really hard, I think he's the one with all the experience and he'll be coming home at a big price, but that's chancing something at a big price each way. It's a wide open arc, I think it's a fascinating race, so there'll be lots of, of different theories to apply there, but we're going to move on now to the Unibet champion hurdle, and of course we're without the title holder, which is a massive, massive shame, but we do have an able deputy in terms of a horse that, if his name were to be on the trophy, you'd say, yep, fair enough, state man is one to three, Irish Point, who was heading for the Stayers hurdle, is 11 to two, and Ibirico Lord has been supplemented by Nicky Henderson with the same concerns about the yard form, but he's there at 11 to one, the impressive Betfair hurdle winner. So let's talk about Statement and his state man and his journey since being thumped by Constitution Hill last year. Yeah, he was. And look, when Nico de Bonville sent Constitution Hill off the bend, he was much too good for Statement. Paul Townend, I'm not going to say accepted, but he didn't grill him from there home and he finished second. This year, he started in the Morgiana, Field du Diary, made the running, and he bolted in, beat Echoes and Rain and Pied Piper. Look, he can be ridden e either way. He went from there to Leopardstown, where there wasn't any pace. Our same horse made the running again, and Imperi Pass followed him and Echoes and Rain. But look, he's dead straightforward, quickened up well from the last hurdle in the Matheson and won impressively. I think he was better again uh, when he went back to the DRF to beat pretty much the same horses. Now, Darrell Road, Imperi Pass passed differently on their next start and you know it didn't suit him Perry pass he jumped out and made the run and statement followed him but he's so straightforward he settles he jumps he's a good turn of foot there's no worries about him staying I don't I don't see any concern for him neither do I I mean his key asset is surely that straightforwardness that you're talking Absolutely about Absolutely, he is and he's so he's so uncomplicated and even when you look at this race and you go through it like where is the pace what makes the running it doesn't matter the statement Paul will just line him up and pop out. And if he's in front, he's in front. If he's second, he's second. He'll keep it simple. He's a solid jumper. I know he fell in a maiden hurdle at Leperstown. He hasn't looked back since, but he doesn't do anything wild. He doesn't stand back and take chances. If he's in doubt, he gets in close and pops them. It's just... He is, and he's too good for the opposition. Yeah, I, I think that's the issue. Not only has he got the best form, there is also isn't a sort of uh, angle in the way that you might ride your horse or force him to be ridden, which is going to undermine him, I think. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, you look at the, the, the two novice hurdles here last year, Lydia, that might get you a champion hurdle horse. The first three home in each race, five in them went chasing. Uh, the only one that didn't was in Perret Pass, and he didn't try. Well, you could argue he didn't train on because he wasn't as good a horse this year, but. You're wondering where are the horses? Well, they all been chasing because nobody wanted to hang around for Constitution Hill. Yeah, this division, well, we've talked all season, isn't it? It seems to be a particular issue. But we do have Irish Point, and that is great to see. And he's got to prove that he's grade one material over two miles. This is him beating Magical Zoe, who's no slouch. No slouch. This is his comeback run in Down Royal. Um, booked out nice and handy, jumped well. He got touched off in a grade one as a novice by Marine National. Um, won a grade one, two and a half mile race quick. And nice. He went a bit right here mm. at the last hurling mm. down Royal. Hadn't noticed him doing that before and grounded out well then to beat Magical Zoe, who had a run under her belt. And it was a good start to his season. We haven't seen a whole pile of him since. He was going down the stairs hurdle route, but uh, he's here now and yeah, he could easily be second, couldn't he? In, the way, in terms of the way he's been trained all season, which has been with the stayers hurdle or, or three miles somewhere kind of circled, does that have an impact on how he was no. trained? No. No, Not I wouldn't slow. think so. Gardens is a routine, same as Willie's. You don't do extra mileage with a horse running a three-mile race unless we want to run in a two-mile race. They do the same work. And because he's straightforward as well, I suppose it wouldn't need, that you wouldn't need to sort of be thinking about riding him any differently either because no, he's settled. Exactly. There wouldn't have been... I mean, even for that lady, you probably would when you were trying to switch off you might ride him behind all the time but you wouldn't be doing any less work with him mm. 
OK. Let's move on to Iberico Lord, shall we? Uh, this is his great wood win, which is how he started the season. He was in the right place down the inside of the track. Since then, he's flopped to Ascot, probably the ground, and the race not run to suit. And he's won very impressively to my mind. Yeah, and I, I liked him on this occasion because in only a matter of time, ducked out of the fourth last, he could easily have followed. And he never even looked. Mm. He's a great attitude, this mm. horse. Um, and he did quick and nicely to go and win here from off a relatively no mark. He did bomb out then at Ascot. Maybe that was quicker ground, didn't suit him. It was drier ground than Ascot. And it was a speed test, the race, as well. It was, but even when you watched it back, he, he didn't get down and lengthen like he did there. I think this horse does like soft ground. Agree. Uh, and I think soft ground is a big thing for him. He obviously came from well off the pace to win the Betfair hurdle at Newbury on his last start. It was an impressive winner. He's going in the right direction. Soft ground will suit him. But again, it's just a question mark over the yard. Now, Berico Lord wins the first, and you're thinking, yeah, this lad's a right each way price in the champion hurdle, but I'd be watching the Berico Lord first. Jericho de Repinay. Jericho de Repinay. Yeah, yeah. OK, let's have a look at the betting, shall we? Obviously. Um, of course. Um, Zarek the Brave, the argument for? Five-year-old would put me off him. Maybe Nick in a place. Uh, other sort of place, Nick, I mean, this is not so steep, his fifth champion hurdle. Uh, his best one was, I think, 2021 when he finished fifth. He's finished fifth, certainly, but they weren't so good performances. Are we overlooking the 12-year-old? I, I don't think we are. Uh, I think he's a great horse to own. They've had wonderful fun with him, but he would be a very much a surprise winner to me. Nimi and Lyon would have to go forward? He will go forward, but he went forward in a very strongly run race at Wing Canton mm. without making the running. And he looks to be the only one, him and not so sleepy. Are they your pace angle? Mm. Possibly. Mm. And then there is Colonel Mustard as well. I just mention it because he could get a sort of pick up the pieces, right? They're going to need to be a strong pace, but first time blinkers, you can see him yeah. potentially and staying. Did on he that improve hill. for cheap pieces last year? I think he did. Mm -hmm. Blinkers might suit him. Okay. Let's move on to the Close Brothers Mayor's Hurdle and have a look at the betting for that. And of course, Lossy Mav towers over them at four to six. Ashro Diamond, her stable companion, is five to one. And it's a big leap to the winner of two years ago, and that is Mary's Rock. We're going to have a look, though, at Lossy Mav's win in the Triumph last season, where she beat Gallimasso. I'm interested in Gallimasso against Lossy Mav. Here. Yeah, and Gallimard so followed, lost him out in the try of Blue Cotille was handy. But I thought it was interesting, Lydia, when they turn into the back straight, John McConnell's horse in the black and white goes off to the right, lost him out, gets outside him and gets quite lit up. And you see her off the top of the hill here, she's half running with Paul. Um, I think she's much more settled this year. But to me, when you start thinking, oh, will this filly stay? Has she got this, this, the class? I think she got things didn't go right for her in last year's triumph. She got racing way too early and still was impressive at the line. I don't think stamina will be a problem for her at all. That was on the new course. She's on the old course tomorrow. I thought she went all the way to the line. I thought she was brilliant here in January. She's a more relaxed filly this year. She's bigger, she's stronger. Gallimard saw is an angle, but like Willie, I know, is blaming himself for her run in Punchestown. But it was a shocking run. It was, it was bad, it was bad. The heaviest ground she's ever encountered yeah, in Ireland. Yeah, he, did, he didn't think he had her straight enough, but I, that's not for me now. I, I think... You need a better excuse than that. Yeah, I suppose sometimes the market, and I think this might be a case of it, overly reflects a poor end last time, when if you look at Gala Marseille's body of work, yeah. actually it's very, very strong. It is very strong. I would still like to have seen her finishing in front of Sailor V. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't argue that that's, the last, that's, one, that's, the last For me, yeah, that, that's where I see it, and I agree with you. I was thinking, like she went to France last year as a juvenile and got better for going a bit further, but I would like to have seen her running better in Punchdown. She ran against Ashro Diamond on seasonal debut, conceding her three pounds. This was at Doncaster, and Ashro Diamond showed that sort of strong travelling ability to show speed at two miles. She has won over two and a half, though. We saw that at Ferry House last yeah, year. Yeah, she won the grade one at Ferry House last year. And um, again, it was a big field race, grade one uh, novice hurdle for mayors. So everyone trying to nick a bit of black type. Um, and she ended up getting quite far back in the middle of the race. Now, one of uh, Jared at Fahey set sail off the bend here, and Paul Townend was never in any doubt that he was going to be able to pick it up because his body language was so confident. Magical Zoe behind him. Plenty of the horses, mares behind, had been to Cheltenham, whereas the two in front hadn't, and Astro Diamond was really impressive. Look, she jumped Brennan to Doncaster. I think the difference for her over Gallimar so at Doncaster was jumping. Astro Diamond down over the last three hurdles, and Donnie was magic. Um, but look, she's a good filly, Astro Diamond, but I just don't think she's up to last year. Hood first time for her, what do you make of that? Yeah, it's tourist to make sure she switches off and settles. She was a little bit keen in Doncaster, um, but yeah, won't do her any harm anyway. 
just just because she's went over two and a half miles in the race, and you've already explained how many of her opponents might have underperformed, and this is a different track, and this is a much deeper race. Are you confident about the two and a half miles for Ashro Diamond and the final climb? Uh, and you probably should be because she has at least one over two and a half, and whereas Lassie Mount hasn't, but I see Lassie Mount as the strongest there than Ashro Diamond. Lassie Mount's Frida does wonder about the trip, and she did win the Beulah via speed, didn't she? She did, yeah. Um, maybe she won't, but you, know, you can have an opinion. <laughs> I think she will. Talking about the Beulah, Le Venvoir ran a bit better than she had done in that in all season in that race, albeit she was thumped by Lossy Bath. Now, they put the cheek pieces on last year's second in this race. What do you make of that? Is it cry for help? Yeah, you were kind of saying that, actually, now, to say it, when she ran in the rearranged fight in fifth. Um, you were questioning whether she, her attitude a bit that day. I just thought it was yard form. Um, cheap pieces are on her tomorrow. I did think she got a brilliant ride here last year. Mm, she it was did. a tactical race. Johnny Brooks sat in front, set it up for himself, and it took Honeysuckle to get by her. Um, I can't imagine he's going to get that lucky twice. Not the ride. There's nothing luck about the, about the ride, but to get that luck as in people the just setup. allow you to set, set, set it up the way you set it up. OK. Um, cheek pieces first time for Theatre Glory as well. And Echoes of Rain finally hood back on her to hood try and help back her get on. off the yeah, hill. Yeah, but, yeah, she was just too far back in last year's race. Um, I think it's her last arch can be going to Stoad, but she's had two chances already. Mm. Hasn't delivered yet. Her last start. OK, that's interesting. Think so, think so. OK, lovely mare. OK, those are our thoughts about the mares. Let's head out to Nick. Well, it's not that warm. It's a lovely misty morning here at Cheltenham. Emmett Mullins is here. One of his four contenders is already on the ground, and that is the horse that runs tomorrow, Corbett's Cross. Big fancy for the National Hunt Chase. How's he doing? Yeah, seems to have travelled over great and um, taken it in well. And, uh, no, we couldn't be happier at the moment. Are you pretty happy that you're in the right race? Because he could have run in a few. Yeah, look, we had plenty of options, um, but I think uh, JP and the team were keen enough to come here, and we have Derek on board, which is a... It's a big acid in these um, amateur races around here, so um, no, that's uh, something that couldn't be overlooked. I think he'll definitely stay. Look, he's an Irish point of pointer. He's one over three miles over hurdles. He had a great run, and ran through the line over three miles in Leopard Centre Christmas without covering any more ground. We, we have to be confident. Uh, now you don't mind mixing and matching. You saw it a brilliant effect with Noble Yates, your Grand National winner in the Cleve Hurdle. What sort of forms he in coming into the stairs? Yeah, Noble's flying. Um, hopefully he's improved again. Um, I suppose at Christmas we kind of got a bit excited by the conditions of the race and he was able to run in the winners of one and he probably wasn't back in training too long and we went for it and that uh, <laughs> took us toll uh, after the line of heavy ground in Limerick. Turn around and she said, come on, you've got to get me fit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, we, um, we, we learned our lesson and um, no, he definitely improved to the leave and uh, fingers crossed now I think he can come on again. It's on the line in the Hunter's Chase and so Scottish in the county. You must be fairly hopeful of both of those, particularly the former. Yeah, no, I would say the, it's on the line. is probably the best chance of the week. Um, he's got all the ability in the world. It's just uh, not the easiest viewing at times. But um, no, fingers crossed he can get the job done this year. Ran a cracker last year to be second and uh, he won't have to improve much. Good to see you, Emmett. Best of luck this week. Thanks very much. Thanks to Emmett for that and we can... Uh, finish, use him to finish off the first day of the festival with a first-time hood for Corbett's Cross, Ponderous Jumper. Yeah, and that. Embassy Gardens as well. I wouldn't be so worried about the Ponderous Jumper. I think uh, Derek rides him. I, I think he'll he'll help him with that. But he was a bit keen in last year's Alabarta, so I can't see why they've stuck the hood on him and he's going up in trip to make sure he switches off and gives himself every chance to get the trip. And the same goes for Embassy Gardens, who was too keen in the Alba Bartlett. Uh, here last year and I'd say that's why he's wearing a hood as well to make sure he switches off but um, two fair horses I'm slightly with the opposition though I'm slightly with Carver's Cross over Embassy Gardens Does em Embassy Gardens find under pressure? I don't know is the honest answer he's been really good as a chaser his jumping has been brilliant he's been impressive but that Albert Bartler run is stuck in my head why did he run so bad that day? I know he was too keen but still he'd beaten too far from home Right, let's move on to the Thursday, shall we? As I said at the start of the show, we'll be coming back to Wednesday when we have a Dex right at the end. So we'll start with the Turners and have a look at the betting for that novice chase. Obviously, we've moved on to the new course for Thursday and Friday. And Grey Dawning, who is all but confirmed, we were talking to Dan Skelton about it uh, on Thursday on the Live Road to Cheltenham show. That horse is now the 9-4 to favourite ahead of Ginny's Destiny, who's beaten him here before. Fasal Viga runs here rather than the Arkle and Oroko, um, who will be having just his second 
can start over fences. He's 9 to 2, it's 14 to 1 bar. Let's have a look at that key clash between Ginny's Destiny and Grey Dawning. Yeah, and look, Genie's destiny, to be fair to him, his jumping has been rock solid. He likes to be ridden quite handy, which some people will be thinking, oh, another stage there. Um, you know, in front, Grey Dawning, Harry was squeezing him for every jump here at Cheltenham, and it all came down to what happened at the second last. But I like Genie's destiny. He can get in and get out. He's very good at what he does. For a novice, he's been very assured. Grey Dawning steps into the second last, and we broke that down at the time. You see how much ground he lost, yet you see how much now he's going to close. Trelawne is on the inside behind as well. Genie's destiny... I think he's a fair horse, but I think he's got some really good rides here this year. Um, and I love the way Grand Dawning chased him all the way to the line. I think by Thursday, it'll probably have dried a bit, but it'll be a bit slower than it was that day. And it's very easy to argue without the mistake Grand Dawning wins that race. It is, but... That was argued about for Billy versus Ginny's Destiny as well. Ginny's Destiny's come out and done even better again on trials day here. He, yes, he's got some good rides, but that isn't that because he's totally straightforward? Oh, it is. It's always a help. You're riding a straightforward horse, but um, you know what you're going to get with Ginny's Destiny. He's going to jump out there, causes it down the inside, and you're going to get a good run for your money. Can he just keep repelling the horses? I don't know. I think he's slightly vulnerable myself. OK. I don't know how much he's got left to find. He might have more left to find. He's fine more yeah, each time. He, he could, and, of course, have horses that keep winning. You should really like them. Um, you know, he's ticking the boxes. I did think Grey Dawning was good at Warwick. Um, I thought he that race won a long way from home. Stamina test, though, wasn't it? But he was the one horse that was able to go at the speed they were going. That never looked under pressure. Apple away and um, Broadway, Broadway Boy. Boy both looked to be going as fast as they could whereas Grey Dawning always looked at ease. Um, as you say a stamina test, I think the other two went too fast and they didn't even stay themselves. Um, and he was just able to travel at the, spe at the speed they were going. But it, they are decent races. This is wide open too, and I think Faso Viga definitely adds a bit of interest to it. He does. Let's have a look at him, shall we? We've been accusing him all season, uh, not just our opinion, but also with figures, with figures mind, that he hangs in the air too much. He does. He doesn't get through the air. Um, and going up in trip should help him going a little bit slower. He's a solid jumper without being a good jumper, and he does hang a little bit in the air, grabbed at the second last, so it was long and low at the second last, missed the last here then, uh, when he got in too tight, rubbed it, got high behind, pecked out in his nose, but actually, when you watch back, he didn't fade as much as I thought he faded in this race. He didn't. Um, you know, he plugged all the way to the line, and to be fair to him, his mother wanted 2-5 and was capable of winning over three miles. Maybe all oh, this fellow wants to trip. Well, and he finally gets it for the first time on a, a galloping track as well. So those, I think, are positives. Now, Tammy, you were saying that Tully Hill has been in intensive schooling. Have Fasal Viga and Gaelic Warrior been doing the hard yards in the run-up to the festival? Not schooling. But no, no, I'm talking about training. Galloping. <laughs> yeah. um, I couldn't see either of them getting tired anyway, Lydia. Mm. Is it basically like you've, you've let yourselves down, you've let Clisutton down, you've let your fans down, so mm. prove that you're Clisutton elite? More like Willie, you've let me down and, <laughs> you know, I like you and all, but lads, come on. Um, <laughs> they have, the screw has been turned on the two of them, yeah, and to be fair to both of them, they've taken all the work they've been given and uh, I know Paul thinks Fasa Vegas definitely come forward, so uh, fingers crossed for him. I think it could make a huge difference to him. So do I, but I still will be watching the two of them, Lydia. Um, I'd, Fasal, that's twice Gaelic Warrior on the last day um, I, Open horses the likes to say of a John Bomb what happened to him here in the Clarence House you know he's gotten to the level before that mm -hmm. whereas with novice chasers you're looking for them to keep improving through their novice mm -hmm. season I hate when they blow out in the middle and both of them did I think Blowout is a bit strong for Fasal Vega Blowout for Gaelic Warrior I'll, I'll give you that but... Yeah but if you're watching Fasal's work you're expecting them to do more than he's doing he does have Cheltenham form in his favour. A bumper winner, second to Marine National in a very, very deep Supreme. Let's have a final look at the betting. You were making a case for Oroco. Yeah, I think he's a classy horse. Um, you know, in an open race, I thought he jumped brilliantly at Warwick. And he, to me, I wouldn't be worried about him in experience. I just think he looks a pure natural at what he's doing. So I think he's a very good horse. A big ask for him off since October, was it? Uh, or early November. But uh, he was a good winner last year's Martin Pipe. It's a race I think that consistently produces good horses. Are we seeing Sharjah here? Sharja, possibly he's in one of the handicaps as well. The plate, yeah. Plate, um, if he runs, what is he? An each way show, max, best. Yeah. And I should have asked, any headgear or aid changes with Fasal Vega? 
We wouldn't it harder. Right, OK. And Zanahir, I've heard people on the circuit making a case for Zanahir twice, third past the post in a champion hurdle. I just don't think he's taken to fencing. I prefer Zanahir and Shaj in the novice handicap in Punchestown or the mm -hmm. Galway plate or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's more their cup of tea these days. I can really see Shaj in the plate, absolutely. Yeah, I yeah. think that's more their cup of tea these, these days. OK. Let's move on to the Ryanair, shall we, and have a look at the betting for that. El Fabiolo still lingers there in the non runner no bet market, but essentially Banbridge is the favourite ahead of Envoy Allen and Stage Star. Banbridge, so we're assuming he's going to turn up, but is the ground going to be soft? We have to obviously treat him like a potential runner, and this potential runner has got top class form, this defeat of Victoria at Kempton. Yeah, a solid jumper, who does like good ground. Or he does like good ground, does, no two ways about it, and that's his, that's his best performances. Uh, tough horse, going two and a half suits him, he tried two miles a couple of times last year, he was good here in the open meeting, all right, but he's definitely better at two and a half, but he does want the sun to start shining, not just the rain to stop falling, um, I think. But I think what happens with the weather the ground the next couple of days, Lydia, is key to this race, because not just for Banbridge, I think it's key for Envoy Allen as well. I think both of them like a sounder surface and if it starts to dry it will really suit them and it will inconvenience the likes of a Capadano who's coming down a Definitely. trip. Um, I think he would want the ground to stay the way it is to keep the pace suitable for him. I'm going to play a slight devil's advocate with Banbridge. It's the Drinmore that is the real issue there but that was really heavy ground. It also wasn't the plan. The tactics also went wrong. I think he'd be okay on soft personally. Yeah, he, possibly he will but I the more I watched it, and I was watching back last year's Ryanair during the week, again by Ireland, absolutely bolted up. Should we have a look? Yeah, in last year's race. I couldn't believe how actually how easily he did it. He lined up quite wide with Rachel, and you can see how keen he is down into the straight the first time. He's absolutely tanking with her. They didn't go hard, Jack and Persuas was in front, and this fella at all stages, you're thinking, he's doing a half speed. Now, probably we were all got drawn to watching Shishkin, who was forward, back, and missing, and I stopped watching Love Envoy at the time, but look at him away from that ditch, and even here when he makes a mistake at the third last, brushes it, nods, Rachel drops, slacks the reins. In two strides, he was back in front with her. Mm. And I look, he's been to four festivals, he's won at three. I think if just stays dry from now until Thursday, he's the one I'd want to be on. He loves Cheltenham. He's had a longer layoff going into this than has been traditional, but he does go well fresh. There's Hitman, who also runs the race. He'll be outrun for second by Shishkin shortly. Galore as well has been supplemented. He was fifth in the race last year. I can't make an argument for them turning it around with Envoire alone. I, I can't, but other than Miller's Bank, I could see any one of the horses go in this race. I think it's really open. Isn't this year's race deeper than the race last year that Envoy Allen won? It is, but I think the stronger pace this year, Protector App in particular, in there, I think Danny slowed it down a lot on Shaq and Porcewall last year. I think it'll be a stronger run race this year, and that'll actually suit Envoy Allen. It means that probably Stage Star, who dictated in the Turners, won't be able to pull those tactics off again. I'd be shocked if he can. And I thought Harry Cobden was brilliant here in this horse last year in the, in the Turners Stage Star. I mean, how much he slowed it down. He let him run to that first fence down the back. It was the only time he broke over 30 miles an hour in the middle of the race. He got six or seven lengths and coasted along at 26, 27 miles an hour then. Like he got it so easily in front and was gone off the bend. Some great jumps helped him. He was good here in the Paddy Power in November when he beat the same horse, um, but I think up in grade with grade one horses taking him on, it'd be hard for him. And also he comes here off the back of pulling up. Paul Nichols has said that he feels he made a mistake running him in, in such deep ground, and I can see him bouncing out the horse goes well fresh, but nonetheless that does play in your mind, doesn't it? It, it does, it, it does play, it definitely plays in my mind, the fact that he pulled up, um, but it's more the shape of the race, and he got in charge in a handicap. He had the gears to go with them early in the paddy power. But he was the one then that got in control of the race. I just think with the horses that are in here, they'll be breathing down his neck and there'll be no slowing down. Let's take a look at that betting. Uh, you've mentioned Protector Rat. We're both quite fond of a positive ride over this trip, aren't we? Yeah, I just think it's something for him to try. Um, I, I think he thought he'd jump brilliantly in Newbury. I think he could run a good race. I'd be worried, like you look at Capadano in the... Cotswold chase here where he was at the back and he wasn't exactly keen and I just think, yeah, if he gets on his feet he could be coming home but I just think some of these classier horses at this trip could just be gone on him. Yeah, I tend to agree and I think his jumping remains a frailty and at a pace. The I only thing is David that. Casey does swear that he'll improve on good ground. 
Oh, interesting. And okay. he rides him a lot. I thought he'd need slow ground to keep the others slowed down, but David thinks he'd be a better horse than good ground. A couple of surprise packages in this. Conflated all season, I was expecting him to run in the cross country and said <laughs> he's here. To be fair, the ground probably wouldn't see it. Well, but also, a Hoy Senor is but here. And to be fair to Conflated, he has been getting off the bend in grade one chases and leopard stand up to the last fences yes. and seats at the last yes. twice so he's running to a very high level and a high senor i've never thought he was a two and a half mile horse <laughs> no me i can't i can't i can't see it at all i still all. think he should be in the stairs hurdle <laughs> Uh, or the or the Gold Cup, one of the, the two. Cup, yeah. um, and if you get this strongly run race, fugitive to pick up the pieces. Could rob a few quid. That's be what surprised I'm thinking. If he's a, I would be will be surprised if he can rob the lion share though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a, a minor share of the, of the yeah. prize money involved. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, he got a brilliant right to win a handicap. He's now gone up in grade, and I think it'll be difficult. Let's move on to the feature of the Thursday, shall we? Which is the Paddy Power Stayers Hurdle. And this is Chihupu at the top of the market. A two to one with Paddy Power. Crambo, the other up and comer, is nine to two. Sir Gerhard is six to one. Noble Yates, former Grand National winner and the winner of the Cleve Hurdle, is sevens. And then it's ten to one and upwards to the rest, starting with the dual winner of this race, Flooring Porter, who runs here rather than in the National Hunt Chase. We're going to start with last year's race, Ruby, in a cast of thousands, headed home by Sider Burley. Yeah, and strong gallop. The Flooring Porter, Dashel Drasher. Home by the Lee, went a really good gallop. Look at the spread on them. To Hoopoo, who's only coming to the second last hurdle now. Uh, this was a really searching gallop set by Florian Porter in front, who never quite got the same anchor on it as he did the year before. Now, To Hoopoo, there to me, is the one that's going best, but he never gets to the front. Now, I know Dashel Drasher ran across him and Sarah Burley came from behind him, but to be honest with you, I think he had every chance to win the race. I don't um, agree. I do. I think if he was. I can't have him been as unlucky as people maintained. Now, maybe the longer layoff, maybe the fact that he's a fresher horse, he hasn't gone to Gorn, which was six weeks away, maybe that will be, make a massive difference, but I think it has to. Isn't it also a year older in a race like the Stayers Hurdle? I think that's got to be a, an asset. I mean, look at the horses and the ages they are and then being at the forefront yeah. of this division. I think that might be a real key to Chupu. It could be, but I think it's going to be a pretty similar race. I think when you look down to the horses, most of them are the ones that ran in last year's race. I think it'll be a similar enough contest um, as regards pace and getting into stamina, getting into a bit of a slog. Uh, from a betting point of view, I would much prefer each way on Noble Yates. OK, we'll get to him in a moment. Just ha Let's have a look at Chupu's um, Hatton's Grace. This is a career-best performance, this defeat of Ampere Apas. We haven't seen him since. It has been the plan. Yeah, and look, Jack got the right side of Paul. He got behind Paul Townend here on a confirmed stair. Chihupu has a brilliant record at Ferry House as well. Went that in Perry Pass, going to the second last. Both of them hammering tongs to the last. It was a brilliant race to watch. And Chihupu had the legs of him from their home. Astro Diamond back in third. And that was a really good start to the season. And Gordon Elliott, Nedley's colours to the, to, the, to the mast that day in Ferry House said, he's going back to Cullen Tra. Next time you'll see him will be in Cheltenham. He's had a plan for him. Um, and I... I just think being fresh has to make him a better horse than he was last year if he's going to win. Lots of people have been talking about the soft ground or heavy ground is what he needs. It was good to soft when he ran in the stayers hurdle last year. I'm, I'm not bothered if it, if it drives out to good to soft for him. Uh, no, he does handle soft ground though. Really he bad. does, yeah. which means that the others might yeah. not handle it as well as him. Yeah. Just to come back to the stayers hurdle last year, Sider Burley, who was 11 then, ended up the preeminent stayer of last season. This time last year, Gordon Elliott was telling everybody that this horse is absolutely bouncing, a Cheltenham specialist. We all ignored him and the horse won. This time around, he's not he's not quite in the same bullish fr frame of mind. He's saying the he's horse, coming, he's not quite there. Yeah, and he hasn't had the same season either. He had four runs uh, during last yes. winter. This year, he's only had the one. And that's mileage, that's fitness, it's all those things. It's it's miles in the clock, and you've got to bank him at some stage. So I think for a horse that races like Sarah de Burley, the lack of runs is, a, is a, probably a bigger bigger issue. Flooring Porter, dual champion, rerouted here. He'd had a setback at Christmas going into the race last year. Can you have him on your mind this time he around? He could run well. I just thought he got running too early in last year's day or so. And maybe having been over fences, and he's an OK jumper of fences. Maybe he's a bit, he did look, has looked more rideable as he's getting older and that could give him a chance, but I still think he'll be on the front end and you'll have to stay to win. I've heard arguments for home by the Lee, who's got a couple of excuses in this race. He was sort of boxed in and needed space first time round, and last season's race, he made a, a, a mistake. He hated front running. They're going to put the cheek pieces on and get a, get a lead. Can you give any kind of chance? Uh, I was trying to make a case from last year, and he's the kind of horse that will bite you in the rear end when you don't give him a chance, but you can keep making excuses. I'm not making any more excuses for it. 
And how about the collection of, of veterans that are Paisley Park, Dashiell Drasher and Champ. Champ, first time cheek pieces, I understand. He's worked in them and he will wear them. Uh, admirable horses that all add to the Cheltenham Festival and any one of them would get a great reception if they win, but it's slightly fairy tale-ish, I think. OK. Oh, we're going to go and join Nick. When you come back, we'll have a look at the Cleave Hurdle, but let's join Nick first of all. Well, the Durkin family have got a long history with Cheltenham Racecourse, but you have to go back a long, long way to Anna Glog's daughter. One man who was here that day and is here saddling a runner this week for his father, Bill, is Neil Durkin, who's alongside me. That horse is Eagle Fang in the Boodles Fred Winter, alongside assistant trainer Gary Bannon. And Neil, for, for these colours, these famous colours, to be back here with a chance in, in this race, with you and Gary supervising for your father, Bill, what, just tell me what it means to you. Uh, look, you know, we have a small yard and Gary will go through all the horses he puts in the effort to be fair to him but like for a yard of our size to come with a fighting chance and for my father to stand in the ring tomorrow and he'll have his grandchildren around him as well as his own sons and daughters uh, it's a special moment you were 11 years old when Anna Glog's daughter had her famous moment here in the in the champion chase how clearly do you remember it I was a boy a young boy obviously but uh, yeah like as I said to you earlier these were our pets you know that was our playground we grew up with and John who was only a couple of years older than me, like he had a pair of hands on that he could get up on these horses. I remember there's a picture which we have at home on the wall and John, is li he's like a, a 10 year old kid. He's only about maybe 14 or 15, sitting up, no helmet, no nothing. Different times, of course, but uh, that's what we grew up with, you know. And your late brother, John, of course, was the man who found Isterbrack for, for JP McManus and you, you tragically lost him. I, I'd imagine he is very much in your thoughts this week. Yeah, um, you know, there's a, John was a very religious person. I had a little uh, thought going around there, I have to say. And I know if he was here today, he'd be kicking himself with joy and uh, maybe he'd be sitting on Eagle Fang's tail tomorrow evening. Who knows? So can Eagle Fang do it for the Durkins and uh, lift this roof off the grandstand, Gary? You're, you're pretty close to this horse. What do you think? Uh, yeah, to be honest, like, this, this has been a plan from a long, long way back when we first purchased the horse in July. Um, and look, we, we had this in the back of our mind and uh, he seemed to take all the boxes coming here and obviously in Nice the last day, it's a good record out of that race. Obviously uh, coming here, the last four, four winners have come out of that out of the last five years. So fingers crossed um, this lad can do the job. Well, you, you've given me every reason to think that he should be backed and um, I think an awful lot of people now, Neil, will be rooting for, for you and the family. All the very best. Thank you very much, Nick. Appreciate that. Thank you. Very, very much so. Uh, but we need to move on and finish off the Paddy Power Stayers hurdle and have a look at Noble Yates's victory in the Cleave. I mentioned it in passing earlier. They got racing a hell of a long way out. They did, but they didn't go a mad gallop. Noble Yates booked out good and handy. Dashel, Dashel, Botox, Ha, Champ, Paisley Park, all the old warriors in there. But um, and Pais or Noble Yates even was up and back a bit. Paisley Park, the earlier he's off the bridle, usually the better he runs. Now, they did get racing earlier, but I don't, I don't think they went mad. And here... Look, it's the fourth and fifth that are going to come to the fore, Noble Yates and Paisley Park. But I actually think flooring Porter into the stairs hurdle, Dragon, Dashel, Drasher will suit him a bit better. But I also think it suits Noble Yates and Paisley Park. Cheap pieces back on Noble Yates would be a help as well. Mm. Harry Cobden's gotten a feel off him, having ridden him here in the Cleave. Um, I just think at 8-1, to one, and I've thought it for a while, I think he's a brilliant each way bet. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he'll stay really strongly. He's pulling himself up when he gets to the front. He was fifth, fourth in last year's Gold Cup. I think that run, last year's Gold Cup run, puts him in the money here all day, every day. I think that's right, and I do. And he's been campaigned so imaginatively, and he's proved himself to be incredibly versatile. Maybe all horses would be that versatile if they were campaigned in that kind of way. I think they are. I mean, I could do it with my father here now. He'd give us a history lesson and tell us all about flying boat. What did he do? Won the champion chase and ran the champion hurdle the following day. And he's adamant that if it was the other way around, he'd have won boat in the one week. So. Um, it's history repeating itself, Lydia. It is. Let's have a final look at the betting. I just wanted you to, your thoughts on Crambo. He edged out Paisley Park in the long walk, walk hurdle. He's a young horse, an up he and is. cover. And Fergal O'Brien, who's brilliant to see him, have trained a, a, a big winner and get a winner here. But to be honest with you, I thought Paisley Park handed him the long walk. I tend to agree with that. But nonetheless, the horse is on an upward trajectory. He is so going the right way. He is. But I certainly wouldn't mind riding most of those after Mark Crambo got beaten off in a handicap.
So Gerhard, he's awfully short, isn't he? He is. Will he stay? High class horse, but I'm not certain about him staying. No, nor me. And Monkfish, are we expecting him to go to the Gold Cup rather than this? I think so. I think Willie's hell bent on thinking, look, we thought he was a Gold Cup horse, he's had a full season's training, he's ten. If he's ever gonna run in a Gold Cup, this is his year. Roll the dice. That's the way he's thinking. Right, okay. Talking of Gold Cups, let's move on to the Friday, shall we? So we'll start with the Triumph Hurdle. Now by this point. I think everyone will have a good handle on where the Nicky Henderson form is at. Now, Sir Gino drifted quite markedly uh, this week to the point where questions were even asked of Nicky Henderson. And Nicky was just saying, look, the horse is fine. Nothing has happened. There isn't a problem, honestly. So I don't know whether it was the sort of weight of chat about the form of the yard that maybe caused that spike. But anyway, he's evens with Paddy Power. Majbra is 9-2 for Willie Mullins, along with the, the intriguing Salvatore Monday, who's got that French form with Sergino. Should we start with Salvatore Monday? Yeah, or? he does. Um, I have never sat on him. I know uh, Paul was happy with him. Patrick said he went to Leperstown last week. Uh, Paul was happy with him. Be interested to see what Paul rides. That'll be the biggest indicator for me if he sides with Salvatore Monday. But you know, and even for Paul and Patrick said it. Like you look back at the Leperstown race, Cargi, Stormheart, uh, Bunting. There's not much between no. any of those. Uh, one of them has not stuck the hand up and said, "I am the one." And Majbar, I think for the future could be the best of them. I think he's the most imposing of them. But Salvatore Monday. Big Pat, I agree with Patrick, he's a big ass to come here and win a triumph having not run since whenever he ran in France behind Sergino, who's had two starts in England. OK, so we start with Sergino yeah. and take a look at the second of his starts. Now, he'd come over from France, he managed to win impressively at Kempton, but he didn't jump that well. He had some intensive schooling prior to this and he was much better in that regard. He was much better. Uh, Milan Tito went a good gallop, James Bowen left him off um, and judged it perfectly and was really confident on him. Burdett Road was stalking him. And even at the last, I think it's when he's in front, Sergino. He does back off and has a look when he's in front, but I was really impressed with him this day, Lydia. I thought he quickened really well. He scootered up the hill, and I remember thinking, oh, I'm not sure we have one that's going to beat no. that. No, I mean, he's quite, he's still quite raw, but he's obviously got, he's got the scope to have a future. He's got a huge amount of ability. That was really exciting. If those horses, if there was no question mark about the yard, you could be sticking him in with Stapeman and lost yeah. him out. Yeah. He's in that, I think he is now. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with that. Whereas, if we have a look at the spring, they are much of a muchness here, aren't they? They are, and it gets down to position and pace, places, whatever. I thought Danny got it spot on, and Cargis, Majbra went to the front, Interlato was too keen, Bunting got a bit back, um, Stormheart got back, Bunting gets hung up in high wind here, um, and... Oh, the horse Mikey O'Connor rode on the outside here coming from last. Ethical Diamond. Ethical Diamond. He'd wanted to keep drying, probably. Um, he was better than he was at Christmas. But, look, the mare in front had loads of experience, car geese, whereas the others were, you know, having only their second start, well, Bunting and Stormheart were. But um, there's not much between them. A good jump. Who gets the best run? Which one runs a bit keen? What settles best? It, that, that's hard. Whereas Sergino, he showed he's the best in England. You know Paul Townend well. Which way do you think he'll jump? I'd say he has it in his head. I, I, I'd say if he goes with the Leperstown race, he'll ride the horse he rode the, he'll ride the, horse he rode the last day. Uh, Stormheart. Stormheart. But he could go for Salvador on Monday. And I'm not asking him today. He says enough on his plate now. You've waited with the no, no, no. hurdle. <laughs> and a slightly different question. Which one would you ride? Which one would I ride? Uh, which one would I ride? I haven't ridden any of them, so that would definitely inform the decision. Um, I'd probably rank JP, see if I could get out Mashbra. <laughs> <laughs> you liked Mashbra, you've been talking about him for a while, haven't you? And it's the quality, though, you think he's a horse with a future. Yeah, right? but I got sucked into riding a few of them in Triumphs as well, and I didn't win either. Um, but, yeah, I do, I think he's the, he's the one for the future, yeah. But you have also mentioned Ethical Diamond plenty of time in dispatches, and he became quite a wise guy horse on the circuit. Yeah. I don't think he jumps well enough, does uh, he? He disappointed me at Christmas. Uh, his work was very good. Maybe good ground will really help him. But, like, he's, again, you're looking at it from a, pr a price point of view. I don't think Bunting or Ethical Diamond should be that much bigger than the couple that were in front of them. I think they can easily catch up with them. So I just think from a pr pricing point of view, Bunting or Ethical Diamond are the each way folks. Let's have a look at the betting just one final time before we move on to the Albert Bartlett. I'm quite interested in Nürburgring. 
Yes. He was the best horse at the weights when he ran into Carghese and Calaconti at Christmas. We haven't seen him since. That's been the plan. It hasn't been, you know, he hasn't had a setback or anything. He's going to stay really well. Joseph O'Brien has given some really positive updates on him. I like him. I, I, yeah, I Not to win if St. Gino's yeah, in form. Yeah, but I, to... I, I agree, and that's what we're looking at here. But I think Ethical Diamond and, and Bunting at 14s, they're double the price of Carghese. She was in the right place. They weren't in the right place in Epperstown. So I, I just think there's value there, that's all. Yeah, OK, and then there'll probably be a betting without market as well, which, which could be oh, quite definitely. interesting, because you'll get the win aspect as well to your, yeah, your bet. Yeah, each way without. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. OK, let's move on to the Albert Bartlett, shall we? And uh, Gidley Park, it has been confirmed, runs here by Harry Fry. But there are three Willie Mullins <laughs> at the top of the market, Reed and Tommy Wrong, Dancing City and High Class Hero. And we're going to start by talking about Dancing City and his win in the, the Nathaniel Lacey at the DRF. Yeah, and it was a surprise win. Um, obviously, you know, Paul went for the Jiggenstown horse and he ran a bit keen after being running over two miles. But... Dancing City, he had solid form in there, and if you go back to his bumper form, you can see him splitting Ballyburn and Slade Steel. But uh, he went along in front, Jatara took it off him relatively early in the race, so he sat in and settled behind her. He settled much better than Predator's goal. Paul rode in the first quarter to Jiggenstown at the back, and it was how easy he gets out here, though, Lee. He jumps the second last, Danny kicks him into the gap to make sure he gets out there before Paul gets to close the door on him. He got in there really easily and was always going to win from there home. But I think he beat. Jatara, who didn't do things, got things wrong in the middle of the race, and Predator's Gold, who was too keen, and it was workmanlike. But what the case he said to me last night, the winners of this race, particularly poor record. I shall. Yeah, they do. Uh, you'd think, looking at that, though, that the extra two furlongs are going to suit. You would think it. Um, and I guess just either he'd one or two poor runs that kind of made you think, oh, maybe he's not what we hoped. But he has a couple of runs there that actually do make him. The bones of a great one horse. Yeah, it? yeah. Then there's High Class Hero, who's been bossing small fields, essentially. Yeah, he has, um, and he was off for a while before he won a Thurlis. This wasn't a brilliant race. Got a big keen with Paul as he went to the third hurdle, uh, but he settled relatively quickly. The time he got up the hill and Thurlis, he'd switched off again. He quickened well between Rod Path and one of Henry's going to the second last and put this race to bed and then got a bit tired from the back of the last hurdle. But, yeah, I think he'd have to improve. I don't think... Dancing City or High Class Heroes Farm is anywhere near as good as Reed and Tommy Wrong's. Yes, let's talk about Reed and Tommy Wrong. He uh, ran down Eel Atlantique in the Lawlers of Mace despite making a mistake at the final hurdle. And the way he jumped early on made me think that a tempo of a three mile race might suit him better. Yeah, and that's the way he is. He's a really relaxed individual, uh, very quiet horse. And I think that Albert Bartlett is made for him. I thought he showed a good turn of foot to get to Eel Atlantique. And I liked how he quickened again, as you say, at the last. Eel Atlantique flew it. Uh, reading Tommy wrong wasn't as good and had to go again. And I love the way he went again to beat the Atlantic. Which way do you think Paul Townend will go here? Uh, I'd go reading Tommy wrong. I'd be surprised if he doesn't. Right. More betting, just to have a look at some of the other contenders. What do you think of Harry Fry going for this? I think he's in the right race. He's right. not a strong stayer, a work, uh, tough horse. Shanna Bob, as you squeak. And I think Captain Teague is a chance. So do I. I think it's, uh, you know, shallow winners. I think are always crying out for a trip. This fella stepping up to this distance. Fly ran really well in last year's champion bumper behind a dream to share, in fact, a file. Um, and I think he's a big runner here, eight to one. I think he's a great price. Yeah, I, I think he'll run well as well. And uh, there's been some arguments crafted for Johnny Hu, who shaped well behind him in the cello and looked as though he'd improved for a trip as well. Yeah, I think if they'd gone around nobody again. Captain Higgins still be in front. <laughs> and Lecky Watson, how about him? He looked yeah, like. Yeah, and he ran a cracker and Asher shot in a bumper. Mm. He just needs to switch off. And if he settles, he looks like he's crying out for the trip. One first time up over 2 6, I think, a turnless or 2 7 even. Um, so distance really helped him. And, and final thoughts just on headgear, earplugs, etc. Age of the Willie Mullins uh, lot. Is there anything that you know might be happening? I'd say Lecky Watson will wear a hood, but I would say that I don't know. Right, OK. He'd be the one I'd be thinking I couldn't see the others needing it. OK. Myself. Those are our thoughts on the Albert Bartlett. Let's rejoin Nick. Lydia, thank you. And the Albert Bartlett will be run on the new course, which is where I'm standing now, by um, one of the fences that will be jumped in the Gold Cup. John Pullen, the clerk of the course, is with me. Uh, John, let's start with the back end of the week. Try and predict what the, we what the ground's going to be like Thursday and Friday. <laughs> Bad enough trying to uh, sort it out for the start of the week, Nick. But, um, no, I mean, we're, we're soft ground on both old and new courses at, at the moment. Um, 
we had seven mil overnight into yesterday and then a further four during the day, uh, sort of back end of the day uh, and into yesterday evening. Uh, you know, sort of local area had double digit rainfall, so we were lucky to miss the worst of that. Um, today, forecast is sort of overcast, but no rain. Uh, might get a little bit of drizzle, but nothing measurable. And, uh, and then tomorrow there are a few more showers around, so we could see something between two and four mil tomorrow. So but nothing deluge-like? No, no. Thankfully, um, you know, the forecast is just indicating showers and, and sort of minimal volume. So mm -hmm. I think we've seen the worst of the, worst of the rain. Uh, so we'll, we'll certainly start on soft. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, really it will depend on, on what we get tomorrow as to how that holds then ahead of Thursday when we switch to the new. OK, what do you think we're going to get? It, it looks as though it's going to get warmer as the week progresses. Yes. Is it going to get drier? Yeah, so um, once the, the showers have, have blown through on, on Tuesday, it looks as if they'll, at the moment, as if they'll finish around lunchtime and will be dry for the afternoon. OK. Wednesday itself looks dry, and it looks as if Thursday... It's, it's a bit hit and miss, and, and some of the forecasts are, are, are changing, but it looks like we'll get showers. So I think, you know, we've got Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday to dry back before we start and get those showers on Thursday. But I still think we'll be we'll be starting on soft. But uh, you know, it, if we don't get too much on Thursday, it, it might just quicken up a little bit for Friday. So you think we could be looking at a good to soft Cheltenham Gold Cup? Potentially, if we don't get too much between now and then, yes. All right, I'd be really interested in your thoughts as how fast tomorrow's Supreme Novices Hurdle is going to be. That normally is is the best way of telling us exactly what this ground is. Yeah, I, I don't anticipate it being too quick. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've only a week ago we were we were you know pretty pretty. Soft Do you think nicely over four minutes? Yes, I think I, th I think we will be. Yeah. Um, you know, it's um, it, 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 the moisture is very much there, and you know, in, in, through the profile. And, and if we hadn't had those sort of five dry days last week, then uh, you know we'd be pretty testing ground. But they did it the world of good. They enabled us to, to take that seven mil overnight into yesterday really well. And yesterday morning, it, it, it walked beautiful ground. Uh, we've had the additional four, um, but I think we'll be soft. And, you know, it, it, it's not going to be attritional by any stretch of the imagination. But, um, you know, that they won't bounce off this, uh, you know, Tuesday. Cross-country course, lastly. How soft is that? Very. Uh, you know, this... this is, top... I mean, is it raceable? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perf perfectly raceable. But the this top loop is the, is the, the bit that really is testing. Um, you know, it's not had the same level of investment in, in drainage as, as the old and new courses. Um, you know, we use it three times a year, but we've we found a few areas that will drain this summer. Um, but this top loop is is pretty testing ground. The the rest, once you're out in the country, is, is fine. That's you know, that's nice soft ground really. But uh, this top loop will be testing. John, thank you very much. In brief, then, Lydia, it is genuinely soft on all courses at the moment. If the forecast is correct as things stand at the moment, there is a chance that Friday we might see a little bit of good to soft for the Gold Cup. And a reminder that on that cross-country course, get your flippers out. Good to hear that it is raceable, though. There have been some wild rumours going around that it, it might not be. I was driving through <laughs> it that... It is rumour season, though. It, well, it is. It's the yakety-yak season, isn't it? Um, I was driving through that double-digit rain uh, from London yesterday, and I was thinking, good grief, if Cheltenham gets this. So it's interesting to hear that yeah, they didn't even quite... When you fly in to, to Birmingham, Lydia, to look at the water lying uh, all around the country, it's, it's incredible. Mm. And Tewkesbury is saturate mm, it really is but as nick was just saying a chance of good to soft ground for the boodles Cheltenham gold cup which is the race we're going to focus on now so if it were to go that way that would be good news for paul nichols and brave man's game you would think galloping to sean with paddy power the five to four favorite fast or slow has beaten him twice but it's now in deficit to him is nine to two shishkin 11 to two jerry colomb nine to one brave man's game and hewitt both 12 to one 14 to one long press a 16 to one bar we start with last year's race which remember at the time everyone's talking about how deep this race was this was a deep race too oh yeah it was a great race but it's the Gold Cup <laughs> um, and there's going to be another crack in a rule this year look obviously Gallup and Champ got a long way back in last year's Gold Cup you'd imagine he'd be ridden considerably different this year oh his senor was leading him a merry gallop till he disappeared at the top of the hill um, but it was when Gallup and Champ started to get going here Sound Rushing gets brought down the cream came to the top Brave Man's game protect the right Hewitt conflated and Gallup and Champ. and you got the two you wanted off the bend and they went at it to be fair to them ping the second last ball to them Good jumps to the last. Hewitt parted, disappeared there. But um, I loved how he got got up, and I loved the way he went to the line. And I thought it was a great race. And 
I think this horse is in great form. He beat an unsung Brave Man's Game. Yeah. His season had gone beautifully. This season, not so much. He still put seven lengths between himself and that horse. Stamina possibly running out with Brave Man's Game, possibly but nonetheless, did. a superb performance from Galloping to Shaw. But it's stamina what the winner has. The winner has so much stamina. And, and class. And, and class. But you watch him in Leopardstown in particular, it's what he does. When he goes by the line in Leopardstown, especially in the Savills, like he went nearly to Bray to pull up. Um, this is the different kind of ride you would Yeah, he was ridden more prominently. He dropped in, obviously, in the John Durk and got behind Faster Slow on that occasion. Faster Slow didn't run here, but Paul was much more prominent than him. And like it's the distance he puts between himself and Jerry Kalam, why uh, Maximus conflated, appreciated Capitano. Like, I mean, they're not buses behind him. Like they're fair horses when you think about it. And like he beat them up a stick and Paul couldn't pull them up. It was an incredible performance. Went back to the Irish Gold Cup where he took on faster slow. Now I do think faster slow will be he wasn't heavy in this day, faster slow, but he didn't look as hard fit as Gallop in the Champ. And I think Martin Brazza will have a, a fitter, faster slow here this afternoon. Now he has a little look at the wing here, uh, Gallop in the Champ, when he gets there, but he, he quick he met and corrects himself, but Paul corrects him and he comes back in quite quickly and he was impressive. And I think it was here when Paul jumps, you see Paul over the big screen, you're thinking, wow, he really does think he's always left. He's just, this was just trying to get the job done, wasn't it? It was. Essentially. It, it, he'd been flashy in the Savills chase when you wanted to ride him differently and find out find out where he was, essentially, that season after the defeat in the John Durkin and I Yeah, assume. and the Pulchestown Gold Cup. But, you know, it was a different ride. But, yeah, when he jumped the last there, it was get job done, win here and keep a bit for the next day. So we he was in, in a bit behind horses, not jumping so well in the early stages of the Gold Cup last year. Where do you see him sitting this year? I'd say he'll line up handy and then wherever he sits comfortably. He doesn't have to, to make the run or anything, but uh, I could, I'd be shocked if he gets as far back as he got last year. And on the preview Yakety Yak circuit, there's been a lot talked about his jumping. I think his jumping is good. Um, I think he definitely jumped better at Leperstown ridden more prominently. He's not as fast through the air as fast or slow. Fast or slow is an incredibly mm. accurate, fast jumper. Hence the win in the Durkin. Yeah, but I think when he gets down to the last four or five fences that can really count, Gallop and the Champ hasn't let anyone down. The point that you make about run improve for fast or slow from the Irish World Cup is really interesting. Let's hear from his trainer, Martin Brassel. All right, Lydia, Ruby, here's a man who might be having a big say in the biggest race of all this week, Martin Brassel. I can only start with fast or slow, Martin. He's here. He's he in one piece. How's he feeling? Feeling great, yeah. He's, a, he's an easy traveller. It doesn't nothing really bothers him, so we're happy away with him. And are you pretty happy with the way that you've, you've plotted this campaign? And are you confident you can get a bit closer to Galapande, Sean? Sure, look, at, I'd, I'd be hoping that from today on, or tomorrow on, that uh, we might get much more rain mm -hmm. and possibly with nicer ground, better ground, uh, it won't be an inconvenience to him anyway. I was quite surprised by how soft it was when I walked the old course, but I guess the new course might just be that little bit tighter. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, but sure, we'll wait and see. It drains well here anyway, so that's what we'd be hoping. Are you, I, know, I know he ran an extremely good race in the Ultima last year. Do you think Cheltenham plays to his strengths or not? I can, yeah, but last year he was probably at sea early on in that race, first run in the handicap, and you know he'd been used to small runner fields, so uh, I knew there'd be a huge step up from that for him. And look, he only just come up with a chart on the day, so um, he might be still improving a bit. But it's been plain sailing in the run up to it, and so far as it can be. Oh yeah, yeah, has yeah. Uh, what about the other runners this week? Jose Partier in the Boodles Fred Winter, and you've also got Ballymore Boy. You've declared for the Coral Cup? Built by Ballymore, yeah. Built by Ballymore, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, uh, Jose Partier came from France. He was a bit free, and mm -hmm. we had to... He was second his first run, and then we ran him in better races to see what he just dropped his head a little bit. And uh, he didn't the second time. He was very keen. And then he did the third time in Leperstown. It's probably his best run. A bit disappointing the last day, but he's in on one, two, six, probably plenty for him. Handles the ground, stays well, jumps really well, so he'd probably take his time. And if they go fast enough, it could be hard to be coming home well. Mm. And you could have run built by Valleymore in the Martin Pipe later in the week. What swayed you towards the Coral Cup? Well, the ground, uh, slower the ground, the better his chance. Uh, he's lacking experience, uh, hasn't run the handicap, and uh, he's probably rated plenty high for what he's done. But look at he's here, he'll learn a bit from it if he doesn't 
It's quite, yeah. a, quite a short price for a badly handicapped horse, Martin. He is. <laughs> he is, yeah. Well, I'm just telling you now. That's the way it is in my eyes, anyway. Uh, you've played the weather perfectly. You've got the nice wet, wet ground for the first part of the week, and yeah. then it'll not dry up nicely for yeah. fast or slow. And hopefully it's all accurate, anyway. You know what great. they say, the sun shall shine on the righteous, Martin. Well, Good luck. Thank you. Great to hear from Martin Brussel, but two horses of the festival last season, narrowly beaten on, it, into second with each of those horses. I mean, honestly, he, he brought those horses into competitive races and they ran superbly. And clearly, no one is going to underestimate his horses here, particularly nope. not fast or slow. Definitely not. I'm interested by the greater stamina test for him because if we think back to the Punchestown Gold Cup, I know they'd had hard races at Cheltenham, but Envoy LM, Gallop de Champ, Brave Man's Game all got going quite a long way out. Fastest I couldn't go with them and then stayed on past them. Yeah, and that was the thing. You, and that's why I suppose maybe the John Durkin surprised me and that I had faster slow down as a stayer and that's why he won at Punchestown but he showed in the John Durkin he had speed mm. and gears. Um, he, he is a very good horse and you have to have huge respect for him but I just think... I just think Gallopin's on song, and uh, That's good I, to hear. I thought he was. I thought he was just brilliant last year in a really good race, and I kind of agree with you. People are saying this is a better Gold Cup. I'm not so sure it is. I think they've been two good races. Yeah, yeah, and he is a, a champion clearly, and he's been campaigned as well. We've seen him three times this season, which is great to see. So all pass of their elbow as well. Let's look at the Ultima, shall we? I take Martin's point about. Fast or slow being slightly uh, all at sea in the early stages. Ultimately, it took Corrick Rambler to beat him, though. It did, but what fast or slow was was in the right part of the race. You can see both him and Corrick Rambler at halfway. They're pretty much side by side. They got from one big genius between them and just in front of them. So, you know, he was in the right place all of the way in this race, fast or slow. And, he, and look, he did run into a horse that was just better handicapped than him, which was Corrick Rambler, who was winning his second Ultima, but ultimately went from here and bolted in in the Grand National. Mm. Um, so it was a really good renewal of the race. The third hasn't won since, the fourth is coming back for another crack at this race, but it was about the front two really, and faster, slow and Cardi Grambler, two horses that were well ahead and the handicapper ran into each other and Cardi Grambler got the prize. We can't dismiss Cardi Grambler either, as you said, he had the Grand National win such a long way out. This season he built markedly on his first run at Calso with a, a really encouraging run in the Betfair chase and this has been the aim since. It has been the aim since and it was equally, his run in the Betfair chase was equally as encouraging as his run last year in Newbury in the Coral Gold Cup, so um, he's going the right direction. Obviously, he's been a better horse in the spring. A lot of Lucinda Russell's horses seem to be. And, uh, yeah, look, at a big price, I could see him. I could see him nicking a place. Um, I won't be shocked, because I think he's a very good horse, but I'd still be a little bit surprised if he wins. I don't know. I don't know how good he is. I don't know how good he is either, but I'd still be a little bit surprised if he wins. Well, on the basis that... I think the Gallup de Chaume is one of our, our great modern Gold Cup winners. I think he's shown that in the win last year and the win in the Savills chase. That would shock me. But I don't know what, how good Corrick no, Rambler no, is no, no one does, because I'd say he's only doing whatever he has to do. He doesn't do any more than he has to. He's a quirky individual. He doesn't like to be in front too long. Um, he pulled himself up on the Grand National. But I just think at grade one level, there is a difference, Lydia, mm -hmm. at that level mm -hmm. compared to the top handicaps. It's usually the middle third of the race where the press, the pace, the pressure stays on. I don't know, has he the... Will that really suit him? I'm not sure. I think he could get caught in the middle of the race. Derek Fox is, is a good rider who will, won't force him, and I just think he'll have too much ground to make up. OK. Let's take a look at the King George, shall we? This is the race that Shishkin shoulda, woulda, coulda won. Shoulda, woulda, coulda, yeah. Uh, Without doing Hewitt down in any way. No, and look, he roasted him out of the gate, Nico. Uh, they went, they didn't go mad in the King George. They went quite steady, and Nico got involved in the race early to try and make sure it was a solid enough gallop. Frodo was rocking along. Alaho, brave man's game, made a mistake, never going or jumped like he can. Hewick halfway, he's any price you want, flat to the boards. And I think Shishkin was going to win, stands on himself at the back of the second last, gets rid of Nico, bumps into Brave Man's game, hands it back to Alaho, he can't get the job done. Brave Man Games comes to chain Alaho and lo and behold, Hewick runs over the top. Now, Hewick was ridden, he was going as fast as he could, but if you think he was one of the ones on the front end in last year's Gold Cup, mm. he dropped out to win the King George. I wonder, will they ride him differently in this year's Gold Cup? Will they take their time with Hewick? Um, I think he was coming idea. to the end of his tether in last year's Gold Cup when he fell, but I wonder, will they change tack with him and ride him to come home? That's an interesting idea. I mean, I, he, he ran above himself, to my mind, in last year's Gold Cup. Since then, I've seen the quality of the horse. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Will they give him a chance and, and come home 
I, I honestly don't know. I just thought of that there now. Is that what you do? <laughs> I do but just thinking about it, I just think, well, you won the King George coming from last, so... Because he couldn't... I mean, weirdly, he couldn't go, he couldn't go the steady pace. No, but it just... It did suit him, so you'd have to... I know he made all to win a goal by played. He was ridden prominently in the Kerry National, but when you think about it, yeah, I probably would drop him in. Interesting. Definitely give him a chance to get on his feet, get travelling. Yeah. In interesting to see what Shark Hanlon decides that he's going to do with Jordan Gainford back on yeah. board. Um, Shishkin. So everybody played nice down at the start of the King George, didn't we? We need to go through, through the back history of Shishkin this season and previous seasons uh, as well. My fault, sure, it was my fault. Yes, it was. You, you, yeah. you. Listen, Nicky Henderson listened to you and put cheek pieces on, and the horse refused to race Ascot. What do you have to say for yourself? I'm sorry, Nicky. <laughs> if only Nicky wasn't such a good listener. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so then they took the cheek pieces off and they went to Kempton. They had tried to go to the to elsewhere in between, but in the end they went they went to Kempton. Um, and there was a one continuous movement when they were walking around at the start, onto the track proper and through to the start. I've noticed, I don't know whether you have, that jockeys seem to find the starts are much more important things at the Chetna <laughs> Festival as compared to the rest I of the year. I would just think that even uh, if they get away first time and he gets the start he wants to get. I think they came from the outside to in at Kempton and Nico was able to get himself into a position towards the inside. I think in the Gold Cup fresh ground on the inside, if Shishkin is reluctant through the tape and takes three or four strides to get going, there'll be a lot of closed doors in front of him. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the matter of him not really travelling mid-race either. Yeah, and look, last year's Ryanair, I think, I think that to me is the race to watch if you're given Shishkin a chance in the Gold Cup, go back and watch last year's Ryanair and then have a chat with yourself. I agree, but yet he also ran down a hoist and you're in the Betway, in the Betfair uh, Aintree Bowl, or whoever sponsors it these days, um, at Aintree. He is unexposed stamina wise. Oh, he is. He'll be five finishing. Runners, though. He'll be finishing. Was it five runners in Aintree? Yeah, something like that. Two straight, si two straight sides, two bends, much easier to ride a horse like him in a small field uh, with, with lots of straight lines not so easy right of here yeah I, I tend to agree with you but i'm just putting the counter argument um brave man's game this season has not gone so well has it i mean he he was he met deeper ground in the charlie hall possibly wasn't fitting the sand made that chance ending mistake he ran again in the betfair chase and then he ran in the king george paul nichols has said in retrospect not the best campaign perhaps no but sure look everyone makes mistakes and uh, it's interesting that paul is getting confident and uh, getting bullish about him. He's running last year's Gold Cup. It was a very solid run and would see him placed again this year. Um, but he will want it to dry out and you'd want the vibes to be as positive as they are. Are we ignoring gentleman's game by Possibly. somebody who has trained a Gold Cup winner in Mount Morris? Who, the horse will definitely stay and he won Cries the Charlie Hall. trip. Um, likes nice and OK ground. He's a solid jumper for a horse with very little runs. Um, yeah, he has a squeak, a squeak, but just would love to see more of him to be able to assess him better. Uh, you're guessing he was getting Brave Man's Game, had the penalty in the Charlie Hall, hadn't he? Yes, I Gentleman's think so. Game didn't. Yes, yes, he did, yes, you're so, right. So, yeah, that's another thing. Yeah. Mm, unexposed. Yeah, he is unexposed. Stayer. Yeah. Just has to go and do it. L'Ompresse, how, how bothered are you by the Ascot run last time? Um, not bothered, he just looked like he, he hadn't the gears to go with. Pick Dory, Pick Dory was always going too fast for him. Um, obviously, jumping a bit to his left, yeah. wasn't it? Uh, suit him here. But he just looked a bit flat at Ascot, and maybe, maybe Venetia was right. Get the second run into him, get the bounce out of the way, and have a go at the Gold Cup. Um, but he'll have to be the horse he was when he won the Brown Advisory. He has to be that horse if he's going to be competitive in this Gold Cup. I think he could be. I mean, he's won the Fleur de Lis. He came back with that, that, that good performance. And I, I think he, he could be a stayer. I'm inclined to ignore the, the Ascot run. Yeah, I, I'm not so that I'm worried about the Ascot run. It's a bit like Monkfish. It's three years since Monkfish was here. It's two years since Lampresse was here. that point. They have to be as good as they were as novices. And unfortunately, they're like every athlete. When they start getting time off, are they ever as good as they were? I'm not so sure. I think it should always be a question in your mind, certainly is in my mind as, as a punter. How about last year's brand advisory where the wheel whacker clung on from the rallying Jerry Colomb who just wasn't able to hold his position I and get away from fences quickly enough? Jerry Colomb will 
run a better race than he ran at Christmas. Um, I always have in my head that Jerry Colum, big placid individual, he was quite edgy in Leperstown at Christmas. He was on his toes before the Savills and he didn't keep going. I thought the one thing he was guaranteed to do in the Savills was to stay and it didn't look like he did. So I actually don't think that was his true running. Okay. I think he'll run a better race, but I don't know if that's still good enough. Yeah, I, I think it'll be better than we saw at Christmas as well. Let's have one lingering look at the Gold Cup betting there to see if there's anything we should be talking about. Should we be talking about Jungle Boogie? You give him an honourable mention. Well, you know the horse. We give him an honourable mention. You, you, you don't. I mean, he stays. We saw we, he he won the New Year's Day chase through stamina he, when they got he, going. He did, too, yeah. And Norton's kind won the Gold Cup, so he's, any, he's kept anything, body and soul any, together. Any, anything can happen, but he's kept body and soul together this season, which he, he never has done before. No, fair play. Uh, do I think he's a Gold Cup horse? I think he got gifted a race in Tremor. And I think when you look at the third horse who was coming home doing a million was Manila Crooner. And you look at Manila Crooner in the Bobby Joe chase, I'd say you'll find that form is a long way from Gold Cup form. And completeless, N Nassalam, he's going to need it to be really testing, isn't he? Yeah, look, he was brilliant in the Welsh National, but again, he would want... He could have done with those double digit rain that fell yesterday and didn't fall here. So... We both think Gallop Indichon is going to retain his title. I hope he does. I mean, I, I love seeing a brilliant champion. One horse to to hit the frame behind him. Uh, Martin's horse will definitely hit the frame. He'll mark fast or slow. Um, I think they are the best and second best horses in the race. And, and what I, I think they'll be the two heading off the bend this year. That's interesting. I, I'm going to say I think Clark Rambler can hit the frame. Yeah, I, I think he could be placed, yeah. 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 I think he'd be coming home to be placed, though. I don't think he'd be in it. Right, that's our thoughts on the big one. We have one more day to bring you. We will have the declarations for Wednesday when we rejoin you. It's funny, though. <laughs> I, I actually went through the race a lot in my head beforehand, and I kind of knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Like, I knew David was going to jump and go because he'd done the same in Leprosound. Yeah. Uh, and I had a feeling what was going. Ruby was going to follow me one side and Barry was going to follow me the other side, and that's literally how it played out. And it was actually like a piece of work. Yeah. I rode him as if, like David, was, I didn't want to give him too much of, it, of leeway, le, leeway and it, I was just trying to judge my bit of pace and it was literally like riding a piece of work with yeah. jumps in front of you. That's I was just so comfortable the whole way through. Yeah, I never came out of third gear. Right, our team back at Ealing, particularly the graphics team, have been beavering away to bring you the updated betting for the declarations for the second day, the Wednesday, which are through. So we're going to start with the Gallagher, new sponsor of the Bearing Bingham, and take a look at how that looks in terms of post declaration. 8 to 15 with Paddy Power is Ballyburn. His stable companion, Il Atlantique, is 4 to 1. 15 to 2, Predators Gold. He's scared a few off, hasn't he? Handstands, 12 to 1. Jingo Blue, 20 to 1. Mercury, who's been talked up in many uh, um, preview shows, and also by the team, um, he is there at 20 to 1 as well. We're going to start by taking a look at the uh, DRF run where Ballyburn put paid to stay Slade Steel. This was such an impressive performance. The best single item of novice hurdling form coming into this festival. I thought so. He travelled uh, strongly for Paul Town and dropping down in trip. I thought he jumped super state steel sat just behind him. Uh, they got involved very early in the race, jumped to the front uh, before as they before they crossed that road in Leppers Town and look. He was always in control. I thought he showed a really good turn of foot here. He bypassed the last hurdle as well. And it was that change of gears that you were thinking. Look, he showed he could cope with two miles, but also that turn of foot that Ballymore winners need, yes. or Gallagher novice hurdle winners need now, he has it too. So he does look rock solid. He's a solid jumper, and yeah, he's very good, Lydia. I suppose the other side of looking at it is we could have probably all list off three or four really hot pot novices that got stuff here, Sheltham. So um, those things happen too. What was his reputation and place in the hierarchy at the start of the season? Was he right at the top? Right, he was. He was a good bumper horse. So himself and Tully Hill, Il Atlantique, um, of the bumper horses would have been would have been right up there. They were the three that had big reputations as bumper horses. And obviously Ballyburn and Tully Hill didn't come here last year for the for the bumper. Uh, they both went to Punchestown. Tully Hill went for the champion. Ballyburn went to win the winners. But um, they both had good reputations as both horses. He's got stamina in his pedigree as well, but as well yeah, as that turn of foot. He has everything. Um, and it just does, I don't think he does anything wrong. 
Some have spoken about him potentially pulling because he has that low head carriage and seems to want to go faster but Paul has always maintained that that's just him it's actually not an issue yeah and to watch him at home he doesn't look to be keen at all uh, that is the way he goes along just with his head down and I think if you throw the reins at him he's not going to go much faster okay let's take a look at Il Atlantique shall we? we've already mentioned this run in passing it's the Lawlers of Nace where he jumped the last in front but was run down by Reed and Tommy Wrong in the green he goes to the Albert Barla Il Atlantique comes here yeah he got left in front early here Chapeau de Soy made two mistakes early and Il Atlantique got left in front obviously Firefox sat just on his tail uh, but it was Reed and Tommy Wrong who came to the fore I thought here he jumped the second last he was going to go away and win gets a really good jump at the last and Reed and Tommy Wrong is slightly more deliberate at him, but reading Tommy Wrong just wears him down and outstairs, outstays him now. Firefox beat him in a bumper, so did Stellar Story. He was very impressive in his maiden hurdle at Gorham Park here at Atlantique. He is a very good horse, um, but he's just been worn over a couple of times, hasn't he? Mm. That's the thing. So, three times he's been in a close finish, three times he's been on the wrong side of, of that finish. What do you make of that? <sighs> it's, I don't know. Um, you'd like to see him have won one of those battles. Um, was the reasons for it? I don't think there was any excuse for him in this. I just think that maybe the stronger stayer beat him. Mm -hmm. uh, myself, I thought he jumped well. I thought he was in a good position. Thought he travelled well. Uh, he's a very good horse at Atlantique, but just when it gets down and dirty, has he the resolution to beat Ballyburn? I don't think so. Is there a different way of riding him? Well, of course will he get he will. it. He'll try. The, not going to ride him the same way after he, after being beaten on his last start. I imagine Paul will follow, or Patrick will follow Paul. Mm -hmm. um, and try and have one go at him. I'd imagine that's what he'd do, wouldn't you? OK, let's have a look at the betting, shall we, for this. Um, there was some chat about some cheek pieces, weren't there? Or was it a hood on Predator's goal, but he's not wearing anything? Uh, no, he's only dropping down the trip. He'd run over two miles, then went up to 2.6, and he was too keen. So um, he's dropping back here a little bit in trip and in a better race, I'd imagine. Just definitely wasn't putting cheek pieces on him, anyway. <laughs> um, Statistics-wise, if you're trying to get uh, the Willie Mullins first string beaten in either the Supreme or the Gallagher, you're on a losing, a losing long, a long losing run. Oh yeah. Mm. Statistically, it just it doesn't. It's not a good plan. Good. <laughs> and how about the how about the um, the British chance? Handstands. Handstands and yeah, Dick I like handstands at Huntington. Um, obviously, it was a really wet afternoon in Huntington and Hunting was quite wet but I, I did think he won well for mm -hmm. Ben Pauling and Harry Cobden I thought he jumped well the yard is flying I liked him from the last hurdle to the line in Huntington as well I thought he, he dug in and kept going and uh, Jinko Blue he's, yeah, he's a fair horse isn't he mm -hmm. up to this level Don't has know. to go a bit has to go a little bit again the team you'll be having the evidence of the first day as well for the, for the Henderson team and can you row in with the, with the whispers of Mercury out running his price yeah, you could, I could row in with Jimmy Desai doing the same. He could outrun his price, but uh, Mercury... He could outrun his price, but could he finish third? Like, that's where he might end up. Mm. It's a Mullins-tastic race, isn't it? Let's move on to the Brown Advisory, shall we? Now, there's some uh, unfortunate news here. Sadly, we don't have Broadway Boy. Now, he had been taken out of the National Hunt Chase to run in this. He's had a bad scope and, unfortunately, won't be turning up. As had been reported, Stay Away Faye, last year's Albert Bartlett winner, will be wearing first-time cheek pieces. Factor File, though, is the 10 to 11 favourite. We're going to look at Factor File's form. And, first of all, his clash with the horse that's been supplemented for this race, American Mike. Yeah, this is first time over fences and American Mike dictated it in front and showed the better turn of foot, uh, pinged the last and got away from Factifile. Factifile stepped forward from that, went and won the next day and then obviously headed on to the Dublin Racing Festival. Um, his three runs have been over two and a half. He goes a bit to his right. I know he was following Gaelic Warrior, but he does shift right himself, mm. Factifile. Uh, got a bit keen early in the back straight when he landed beside Gaelic Warrior, but Mark was able to get him back behind and switch him off again. But look, when he was the fourth last when they got together and... Gaelic Warrior nodded that this race was over. Factifile jumps the second last and absolutely flies the last as well. He's a good jumper, he's a strong traveller. This is a really impressive race on the clock. Um, and they're not racing against the clock, they're racing against each other. Um, but it's Willie Stay. And I actually think Broadway Boy coming out is massive. more of a help to Factifile than it is Stay away Yeah, that's massive. That changes the complexion of the race 
a lot. And, and the question you had about factor file was that if it was an end-to-end -end gallop where stamina comes strongly into play is that what he's got at this stage in his career because he seems to me quite galloping de chancy at the moment and yeah, he went turners that's exactly what he, he kind of is and to watch him at home he's really quiet really relaxed but when he gets on the track he's a different horse even watching him walking down behind us here earlier he was in that lot that you know, when Nick was talking to Patrick Mullins like he's strolling down there like without a care in the world it's hard to believe that he could potentially get a big keen because he doesn't look that way mm -hmm. at all. But um, he's a really good jumper, and I think, I think stay Broadway boy was going to be a huge help to stay away Faye uh, to each other. And I think without him, stay away Faye becomes a harder ride for for Harry Cobden and uh, Factor Files turn of foot could ultimately be the winner of this. Yeah, Let, let's talk about that adjusting right though, because we're back on the old course, tightly turning left-handed old course and when you've got a horse that's that short things like adjusting right which he does as you say he does by himself he did it without Gaelic Warrior when he ran previously that that starts playing in your mind a little don't you with the short fraction but it's the old course is tighter than the new course but it's not tight um, it's no I wouldn't be too worried about it and again when you have a horse that goes go a fraction right like factor file he's always going to go worse when something like Gaelic Warrior is dragging him um, so I don't think there'd be anything going mad right in front of him here. He'll go a fraction right, but he doesn't run off right like Gaelic Warrior does. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't be overly worried about it. Not a big field, make it a bit easier for him again. Um, but it's just, uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be more confident about him without Broadway Boy now. Yeah, I right. agree with you. And, and I think it's a negative to stay away. Faye, let's take a look at him winning Deja Chase and beating Gio, beating Gio Vincio. Uh, first time cheek pieces could be a real help for him just to make him concentrate and he was okay early here in Sandown with, with Harry but it's when he gets up past the stands he slowed right down Giovinco's trying to stay behind him and not go near him loose one gets involved and he ends up getting to him but look there's no doubt about stay away phase stamina uh, he has loads of it and he grounded out here in the Alba Bartlett last year but like he I think he would be a better horse with something to run at mm. something dragging him I don't necessarily he's not a he just to me doesn't scream I'm a front runner I'm good at this he, to me he's idle when he's in front and uh, the sheep pieces will help but something giving him a lead would be a bigger help he made one mistake in the Cotswold um, as a novice you saw him there just inside Royal Pagai where he reached at the ditch Capadano had too many gears for him but to be fair to him the Cotswold chase he doesn't give up here Lydia, does he? No and, and this becomes a sprint yeah. and he gets out pace and then he stays on again yeah he does and Capadano had gone to the front to the last but um, you're thinking here oh where is Teo FA is he going to fold the real whacker I know how senior were coming at him but I like the way he kept going but you I'm sure Paul and Harry Cobden would love something to drag him as well. Yeah, he's got game. We know that. We know from the win of the Albert Bartlett last season as well. Let's have a look again at the betting and just have a look at some of the others. American Mike, how do you anticipate him being ridden? Much like he was ridden in Navin, I would have thought. Uh, he was supplemented in here. He jumped super at, at Navin. Um, and I'd imagine he was just ridden just behind the pace. Monty Starr is another really good jumper as well. Yes. Um, I'd imagine he'll be towards the front end. Giovinco doesn't make it. I couldn't see Sandor Kligan making it either. So um, it'd be interesting to see who who sits just behind Harry Cobden and do they push Harry Cobden or do mm. they It's a good thing they him. have put the cheat pieces on, isn't it? Yeah. Monty Starr is interesting. I know that Henry de Bromhead regrets running him so close to, the, close to the festival this time last year. He's deliberately laid him out for this, and a typical Henry de Bromhead horse has improved a great deal from hurdles to fences. I like him a lot. So do I. He's a fair horse. Um, I'm not sure his defeat of Tree Car Bragg is up to. Factor file. Yeah, or even up to what Stay Away Fay has mm. achieved as well. Um, you think with Stay Away Fay rally back to be Grey Dawning at Exeter? I think that's probably stronger form than. Monty Star beating three car bag of punches down. So um, I, I think the second best horse is definitely the second favourite here. Yeah, I think the betting ha has, has it fairly right. Yeah, yeah. And I would the too. angle that, that was there is no longer there. No. Yeah. Small field as well. It is a very small field, yeah. Um, very small field as well. Probably two of them running Tuesday, they should be running that, in my opinion. Yeah, well, well, we'll talk about that more, no doubt, in the next series. Um, right, let's have a look at the big race of the day, shall we, which is the Betway Queen Mother Champion Chase, and have a look at the betting for that. El Fabiolo is 1-2, to two. John Bon is 7-2. to two. Just looking at that, is that too big, the disparity between the two? I, I think it is, and the more I look at it, Lydia, the more I think that 
I think the only horse that can probably win outside El Fabiolo is John Bon. Um, now, we'll know by Wednesday you'll have had a, a good sample of the Seven Barrows horses on Tuesday afternoon, just how, how well they are. And I think Nico makes a big difference to John Bon. Yeah. Um, he didn't jump as well as El Fabiolo in last year's article. I thought he jumped way better here in the slur chase. And um, I think at 7-2, to two, it, it is yard form. One yard is having winners hand over fist, the other's not even having runners. It's also to do with what, what's happened to John Bond this season, and again, probably, as I was saying with Gallimar, so perhaps too much of a reaction to the last run as compared to his body of work. Should we start have a look at the body of work? Yeah, we can do, yeah. Um, and look, you, you start with the Arkle, and look, the fence past the stands here, John Bond jams on quite slow there, and now Fabiolo jumped up to him, and look, Page just showed the figures, and like John, as you look at a little Fabio, you think, oh, he can clout one, but no matter what he did in the Arkle, he still jumped better than John Bond, who never seemed to get into a rhythm, which was very young John Bond like. Uh, Dysart Dynamo with a good gallop in front, and you know, John Bond does get onto his tail off the bend, but Il Fabiolo shoots away. It looks like Il Fabiolo doesn't even get up off the ground at the last fence, but somehow manages to land galloping, and he won quite well, San Roy back in third. But I don't think John Bond performed, and I thought the John Bond in the Schlur was a much better horse than the one that ran in the Arkle. Now, he won twice after that, John Bond, obviously at Aintree and Sandown, and Fabiola won once at Punchestown, but I, I think John Bond in a rhythm with Edward Stone potentially going forward. He's not guaranteed to go forward. Gentleman to me is in there too. Um, I think it'll be a strongly run race. They have suggested they will go forward with Edward Stone, which had been a question yeah. mark. Are you talking about whether he'll be able to boss the race? Uh, well, Edward Stone, to be fair to him, is because of good bit of quicker jumper than El Fabiolo or John Bond. I'm thinking about Gentle de, de Me and Elixir de Nuts. Yeah, I think Edward Stone will be too quick for Elixir de Nuts. Okay. And Gentleman de Me, yeah, he could keep up with him, but again, I'd say your man, your man's a brilliant jumper, Edward Stone. And he loved I, it last yeah, time. Yeah, I think he'd be able to to control it if he wants to. So front. do I. I'd, I wouldn't be so worried about that. But I do think that that puts the other two under not under pressure, but it makes sure that they have they have to be under game. Yeah, they do. And also, I don't know whether uh, undulations are going to suit gentlemen to me. It's an unknown. Figure. It is an unknown, yeah. Uh, Leperstown is his best runs, isn't it? Um, yeah, he has to improve, though. He disappointed me yeah. at the Dublin Race Festival. It's more I'm talking about the shape of the race and yeah. how, how, how after, say, four, how they're all, where they're all going to be. Should we have a look at John Bond in the Schlur? Yeah, I think that I think Edward Stone was going forward to be in front. But in the Schlur, I just thought John Bond got into a better rhythm. He was quicker through the air. Not quite as good as Editor de Geek, but he's almost matching him. Whereas last, in, we watched him in the Arkle, he was losing ground. At least in this race, he was holding his own. And even when he put down there, he was much quicker than he had been in the Arkle. He uh, raced well and truly sewn up until he got to the last fence, which he slows down to jump. But I thought that way, that day, here is one that will make El Fabiolo go. And I think if he gets into that kind of a rhythm, and again, you saw him early in the Tingle Creek. He got into a great rhythm early in the Tingle Creek. I think if he gets into a rhythm, El Fabiolo will have to bring his egg in. And clearly, he thumped Edwardston here, um, but we're thinking Edwardston really enjoyed being ridden to the front and might be a different horse. But nonetheless, that is the, the margin between them when they met in the Schlur. We've been talking about the data that Race IQ has put on this, and we took a page and referred to it earlier as well. Let's take a look at uh, the speed lost, Arkle, Schlur, and Game Spirit. Yeah, look, there's the Arkle last year, and look, John Bond lost or slowed down 4.5 miles an hour. El Fabio on average is slowing down 4.6. You can look at it in the Schlur. Edward Stone was quicker than John Bond. But when you look at Edward Stone mm. ridden prominently at Newbury, under three sec under three miles an hour mm. is what he was losing. Like that's really quick for a chaser. Hurdlers sometimes do that, but from looking at all of these figures, Lydia, he's about one of the only chasers I've seen losing that little speed. He was tremendous, absolutely tremendous. So, in the scenario, which I think you and I both think means that he ends up being being able to dominate the other two putative front runners or forward goers, where is John Bon in this scenario? He won't be too far away, and neither El Fabiolo. Now, this, that pace will probably help El Fabiolo to settle, um, and it will help John Bon's stamina, I suppose, it will bring stamina into it. But you just think Edward's throwing in front, and he's winging and not slowing down. You're having to go after him. Mm and go after mm. him and go after him. Like, he could bring these a long way. And it means that if you make a mistake, You're that could back. be... Yeah. And that could be game over and which in terms one, of your and, chances. And that more so is where you miss. Um, 
like you, you happen to make a mistake early, you've loads of time to gradually get your way back, but if you miss the last ditch climbing the hill, that won't be good. Let's take a look at that last run of John Bonds, which is the one that everybody has reacted to quite so markedly. He was beaten by Elixir, and that's plenty went wrong. I don't think the horse was in the right frame of mind at the start anyway. Yeah, you said that. I just think he never really got into a rhythm, missed that first one we saw, it's guide that that fence uh, backs off here. You see the difference there to the gate there, the green colours to the red colours. In the Schlor, they were side by side. Then he made that mistake at the fourth last, but he just never had the same impulsion in the Clarence House that he had in the Schlur. Uh, now look, the yard has to prove it's in form and he has to be on his A game. But I just, just think that if there's one horse that could beat El Fabiola, I do think it's John Bond on the going there. This has been a pattern in his seasons as well previously, that he's not that impressive in his January run because Nicky's got, he's a horse that's, that's, that's not the most straightforward to train. He's quite, quite buzzy. And I don't think he appreciated being kept in a holding pattern for seven days from the Clarence House at Ascot to the Clarence House when it was actually run at Cheltenham. Other horses, I think, would just shrug that off. I'm not sure that he did. And I think his demeanour beforehand suggested that basically he, he I'm wasn't... I'm in a strop. He wasn't, yeah, he wasn't there mentally in the way that he could be otherwise. Yeah, I knew it'll be, it'll be interesting. OK. And finally, again, Something has been made in the previous circuit. In, indeed, the Racing Post made a story out of Nico de Boinville's comments about El Fabiolo's jumping. Um, to me, I mean, he's, you, you've explained how he keeps his hind end down and he never looks like falling. He seemed to be less likely to make a mistake the more I've seen him, whereas John Bonner seemed to be more likely to be a bit ponderous. Than yeah, since John, I've seen him. John Bonner is a bit ponderous, and that means you're squeezing and forcing him, and Nico Nick will suit that. but. I, uh, Al Fabiolo, he, he, he can take a chance and he's got away with it thus far. I hope he gets away with it again on Wednesday, but he does take a chance every now and then. Any, are there any sort of angles to pick up the pieces late? Captain no, Guinness no, has no, had a atrial fibrillation again, yeah, better I, last time. Better last time, but no, I, I don't see a, a shock here, to tell you the truth. Um, I, I, think, I think Al Fabiolo, John Bon, as I said, and I think Edward Stone will make sure this is a really honest race. Well, if it is blown apart in that kind of way, I wonder about Funambul Civila plodding on, plodding on and hitting the frame. It's the dead eight. It is the dead eight. Could he nick the third? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, we can see your point. Um, no. No, not okay. for me. OK, well, thanks for thinking about it. No, you're welcome. I, I, I appreciate that. At least that was polite. Uh, let's go and find out from Nick. Nick, you've been speaking to loads of people, great atmosphere, and thank you so much for um, the interviews. And I'm, I'm sure that Nick is going to be uh, telling us what he has seen and heard during the course of the morning and what impressions it's left on him. This legend behind me is Smad Place. He ran at seven Cheltenham festivals and he was placed twice in the Sayers Hurdle and narrowly lost out in the RSA chase. He looks absolutely magnificent and it's lovely to see him here today. He is here with this wonderful group and I knew I wouldn't remember everyone's name, but I can remember Kyria. <laughs> <laughs> Kyria, you're here as um, part of Gallagher's partnership with the Jockey Club. How are you enjoying your day out with Smad Place today? It's very good. Mm -hmm. And you are not that familiar with horses normally? No, my first time. Okay, and what do you make of it all? It's good. It's good. And would you come back? That is, that's the most important thing. Yes, okay, I would. Well, I, I hope you will come back. I hope you will all come racing. I will. So, you will? Definitely. Probably. Yeah. Because yeah. my mum works at a betting company and I have the race course on TV in race week Excellent. and every day. It's called you, Betfred. Oh, so your mum works at Betfred. And would you watch my brother? Do you, do you watch us on racing TV as well? Sometimes. Maybe. No, not yet. No, not I yet. haven't seen There's it. There's time. Any. There's time. I, I might see it before. I may go there, but I'm not yeah. sure if I will be able to. I might watch it on TV. I might. And I don't watch that much sports, so. This is I a good start, though, isn't it? Yeah, I don't this is a good start. Either. If mm. I did, I would watch gymnastics. I like gymnastics. You know, you can like gymnastics and horse gymnastics as well. I do. I love horses and gymnastics. And I also love art. You love art as well? Art. 
Well, it's lovely to see you here, and I'm, I hope you, this gives you a little taster of it and you come back very soon. It's lovely to see you. Um, thank you all for talking to me. This is, as I say, part of Gallagher's partnership with the Jockey Club. I'm rapidly running out of time. You guys have been amazing. Sophie Chambers is here from Gallagher. Very quickly, Sophie, just tell us about what you're doing. So we're trying to get as many young people onto a race course and to see a race horse as possible because the love of racing and the love of horses should be what drives kids to come and spend more time actually enjoying the sport that we love. Fantastic, Sophie, thank you very much. Trish Andrews is just behind me. Sadly, we haven't got time to talk, but Trish won't mind. She owns Smad Place. Smad Place, what a legend he is. And let's just hope that um, all the horses that run here at Cheltenham this week can come back one day and do something like this. That'd be fantastic. Thanks for all the interviews, Nick. Ruby and I just need to attend to the poll that we asked you about. We asked you which of these horses is going to be most vulnerable at Cheltenham. State Man, Lottie Mad, Ballyburn or El Fabiolo. This is your answer. El Fabiolo? That's, that surprises me. El Fabiolo, good you know grief. What? Right, I didn't get off the fence last year. I'd probably have sided with them as well. Really? El Fabiolo, why? I do. I think Saitman is the most bomb-proof. Uh, I think Lossiemouth, yeah, really have her. Ballyburn. I just think Il Fabiolo, I think it's going to be a different champion chase. I hope we get a belt in champion chase. But I think the margin for error with Edwardstone rocking along in front to get John Bon on song, yeah, you can see there's definitely more opposition to it. Well, Mark, w Mark Woodward says two genuine contenders in opposition whose jumping can be questionable. Loads of people have said Lossiemouth in reply to me. Um, Colin Smith, that's much a reflection of the strength of the other three rather than particular vulnerability of her. Lots of people have mentioned the trip. A couple of people have contacted me to suggest Ballyburn just because novices in yeah, experience, anything loads, can happen. Loads of them, yeah. Yeah. And Adrian Jan says, I don't see in any vulnerabilities in those four against their respective opposition. We didn't have an E option. Uh, we we're only allowed to do four. Well, thank you very much for watching our preview show. There is more of Road to Cheltenham yet to come. We have got a column each day, so keep an eye on racingtv.com forward slash Road to Cheltenham for that. And also, at the end of each day, you and I will be talking about what's happened on the Road to Cheltenham wrap. I love the way you say we have a column. You have the column. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a column. You're very relieved about that. Am, well. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the wrap, the wrap at the end of every day will be good. We'll be getting our instant reaction to it. So make sure you join us for it. Thanks for watching today. Good luck.